<laughs> so at this time, we're going to have um, staff presentations. We're going to have an awards presentation for us, right? Who's doing that? It's going to be Rich, will be one, and I'll be one. Okay. Throughout the year, uh, the Game Commission employees of all classifications interact with the public in a number of remote areas, recreational areas, and they have various times that they have to respond in order to save someone's life. So, right now, I'm going to explain to you what one of those times was. Uh, there was a legislative bear trip. And the game commission employees were leading a group of legislators, leaving the hotel, heading towards the bear net. One of the massive snowstorms late in the year hit the northeast. It literally caused hundreds of accidents throughout the area. The game commission caravan that was moving, following, going to having legislators fall down to go to the bear den. Uh, encountered a massive multi-car crash on a major highway in the Northeast region. Game Commission employees uh, rendered aid as best they could to the injured, tried to make the area safe, but the accidents were severe enough there were a number of people that were trapped inside their vehicles and could not be extracted. EMS response was delayed because of the number of accidents that there were throughout the region, and in some cases, EMS themselves could not even get to certain roads to access the accident sites. Number of game commission employees engaged in that scene, as dangerous as it was for themselves, on a blizzard-covered highway with a whiteout, um, and rendered as much aid as they could to the victims of the crash. Namely, today, I want to recognize Mark Burnett. Mark is our bear biologist, um, went out of his way. He had a number of sleeping bags, other things like that, that they could render assistance. These people were tracked in their cars in very cold weather temperatures. Very easily, already <coughs> potentially in shock, could have suffered hypothermia or worse. Um, Mark took tremendous action trying to keep the victims calm throughout the incident and render as much aid and comfort as he could, including stuffing the sleeping bags into the holes of these crushed cars. So, Mark, um, thank you, and I'd like to come forward and be recognized. This recipient, um, you know, and I can say this in a very unbiased way, is responsible for the most cherished and treasured resource in the state of Pennsylvania, the wild turkey. Very dear Pasadena.
first part. Hey, now we have yeah. more. Yeah. Because I didn't know there was any words so I ran out of the So now we can continue with staff presentations. You first. Good morning, everybody. My name is Matthew Schnipp, your director for wildlife management. Uh, we have a couple presentations for you this morning. Uh, first, Dave Ronan is going to go. He is the uh, division chief of the uh, uh, diversity set of division for the uh, uh, Wildlife Management Bureau. Uh, we're lucky to have Dan on uh, staff. He's a very knowledgeable guy. He's gonna give you a, uh, kind of a brief overview of where we've been at with the listing process um, and, and kind of where we go from here. Um, and so, Dan? appreciate the opportunity to be here and make this formal presentation with a recommendation on the conservation status changes of a number of wildlife species. Before I get into the details, I'll just mention that this of course represents decades of work on monitoring, research, assessment, status reviews, and careful attention to both the policy and regulations and the law as it lays out a pattern for decision making. And so this really does, while my individual presented slides for the individual species is going to be very brief. We briefed the board before with more details, but now we're kind of really boiling it right down to the key points of decision that we have before us. And uh, you know, so really recognize that this only comes after real serious consideration and um, you know, assessing the whole state, all these populations, with the knowledge that we have to make a, a move that brings an important consideration for the conservation moving forward of these species. So I, again, really appreciate the thought and hard work that, uh, and guidance that's been given to me and the work of the staff. And I'll mention individually, Greg Turner will come up next to address the questions of white of uh, white nose syndrome, the disease that is really being the driver of bat populations. He'll give you an update of the wide range of activities and that really reflects the effort, the knowledge, the skills, and the dedication of all of the staff that are behind the scenes for these recommendations. So moving fairly promptly through, the first recommendation we have is to change the status of peregrine falcon from it's currently endangered and to move it to threaten. Um, I like to think of this as an upgrade, we're improving the situation, so we're moving up. That's the terminology that we've adopted, and I'll explain that a little more as we go. But, of course, long history of activity, but specifically we've achieved the metrics, the numbers that are specified in our management plan. <coughs> the population levels, both cliffs, natural sites, as well as the buildings, we've achieved those recommendations that were thought through five years ago that would say, this is where we feel we need to be before we can move this species forward. And so it's an improvement in status. We're actually making real solid strides towards a delisting, which would be the ultimate goal of any conservation action. We store it to a place where we don't need this extra protection. So but we, we have reached the level of threat at this point, and that is the recommendation for um, that we'll provide to you. And I'll just say a personal note here, you know, each person has different um, pieces in their history. 
And back in 1982, still in grad school, I worked on a reintroduction of peregrine falcons in Philadelphia. So I have like this personal link that's over 30 years old, yes, the evidence is there. Um, but seriously, to see the work and labor that's gone on over decades towards a recovery where we can say this species is safe is personally very gratifying to me. Yeah, what's this on the federal list? Yeah, so it had been federally listed, and it's a good point of reference. Um, it was removed from the federal, I'm not going to remember the year, but over 10 years ago. So at a national level, the population is recovering. And Pennsylvania is dragging a little behind on that, but um, nationally it has been delisted as well. Yeah. And is there, did we change the way we count the, the falcons? You know, there, there used to be a time where you couldn't include those nesting like in a building or well so the, the formula for this metric that I referenced is, is a little complicated but because uh, thinking about delisting say when we take the protections those protect it's still protected bird it's still be wildlife but because of the, the intense interaction that these birds sometimes had with building management and bridge management we felt that we didn't want to count the recovery of those man-made sites like we would the natural site. And the explanation is laid out in the management plan. But that has been the metric we use for delisting. So I'm reluctant to say, well, we had 40 nests. We did have 40 nests last year. But more than half, two-thirds of those were on buildings and bridges where without this protection, we're not sure what will happen. Let's just face it like we had this year where two buildings decided they didn't want falcons on their buildings we went in as a management action to say okay we'll solve your problem we removed those and fostered them to a cliff we won't have the onus we can still do that when they're not listed but you really have that onus and burden to do it when they're listed so we just wanted to be careful that as we advanced the delist towards delisting that once we pulled that trigger you know we removed that final protection Two years later, we think a population would have crashed and we'd have to go back. We do not want that scenario. So it is a cautious, it's a conservative approach, but once we get, as we have to the threatened level, we're comfortable. As we move closer to, to delisting, we'll be comfortable that the population will be able to sustain itself without the extra hands-on attention. Okay, that's yeah. it. it's, it's a nuance, it's worth reading, and um, yeah, the, the, uh, man-made structure is worth a, a quarter of a cliffs of a natural site. Right? Okay. Good questions. So it, it similarly, and it just happens this way, sorry Greg, the bird stories are generally good news stories. Um, and in this case, we are recommending the addition of a bird to the state endangered species list. And you could say, well, how does that represent good news or success? Well, it does because this piping plumber, as you heard previous times in some detail, and I'm going to go over it very quickly, historically nested at Presque Isle, you know, naturally on those beaches. But a lot of pressures and changes have happened along the Erie Lakeshore over the years. So it's been gone for, it was gone for 45 years. It just occasionally would stop by, you know, drop in migration. But uh, the Great Lakes population as a whole is showing this recovery. And as you know, um, has been mentioned before, 2016, a male showed up, which he starts the, the territory exploration. 2017, we had two pairs successful nesting. And again, this summer, we had one pair successfully nesting as well as a territorial male. So we basically, we have this status, biologically, you know, we would call it, had been extirpated. It's moved into recovery. and. Our, our regs represent the, the progress as putting it on the endangered species list. The particulars, um, oops, I'm the wrong way. so basically we're following our own code, the, the, the code from Title 58, which defines a species that had historically been extirpated, you move it on to the endangered species list when you have a population restoration. This also follows the other part of the code, which identifies a federally listed species should be state listed. You know, they go hand in hand. Those actions go hand in hand. So because it currently is federally listed, it occurs now and for two years in a row at Presque Isle. And with the active management that we have there, we're hopeful, we never know year to year, but we're hopeful that that population will continue and grow at Presque Isle. 
The ultimate capacity won't go beyond Presque Isle. It's only going to be at Gold Point. Um, but there's some room for a couple more pairs there. And what I should really say is another example of cooperation with the state parks, with the state Audubon um, chapter, that we have good collaboration with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as a whole towards monitoring, towards habitat restoration. Many partners are involved here. And of course, in Presque Isle, in case folks didn't know, is that northwestern corner of, of Pennsylvania are uh, Lake Erie. It's a significant recreation area for people, but that can be that is managed well where a goal point is set aside for wildlife and it's a unique ecosystem. The other case really is also one of following our regulations from federal listing to state listing. The, the red knot it was listed federally uh, two years ago. It's recognized the <coughs> problems are different. Um, it's, it's a long distance migrant. It has some stopover migration points, particularly on the Delaware Bay um, in New Jersey and Delaware, um, where those, those populations have crashed. So the Fish and Wildlife Service advanced it to a, a federal threatened list, and we're proposing simply that we follow in line. Well, the, the only habitat that's used regularly <coughs> by red knots is also at Presque Isle. It's a kind of overlap with the piping plover. So the polygons and the review process, of course, would go hand in hand with the plover. It's the same habitat. Uh, in this case, however, the knots are only using it as a stopover point. But the stopover migration is really the core issue for this species federally. And while we don't have the numbers and the time periods like the Delaware Bay does, the food resources, but still, that stopover habitat is important for this species. And we believe as a regularly migrating uh, bird, also listed under our uh, species of greatest conservation need in the action plan, we feel that it would just be appropriate to be consistent to include this as a state threatened bird as well. So the red knot. It's not one you're gonna hear a whole lot about otherwise. Is this one where there's a possibility where the, the stopover will drop out and stay there? No, no. In this case, it, it breeds in the Arctic, okay. and it's wintering in South America. So it is. There is so none of them are going to give up. They're like, yeah, this no. is not a pretty nice spot. No. The there is. There, okay. there would be under any biological expectation no possibility okay. of a bird staying in the breed. It might get to stay two weeks, but that'd be okay. Yeah. So you know, you might think of it as kind of just a formal. Uh, compliance with our regs as defines the species we want to be consistent. But in terms of management issues and priority, it's not going to be elevated much higher. So um, the next species we I'll mention, of course, is the northern long-eared bat. Um, Greg will give you a lot more detail on the conservation actions, but it was uh, recently also added to the federal endangered species list. Um, associated, like all the bats, in trouble with white nose syndrome. So the declines that you see, and I'll just show one graph that shows populations. So in a real sense, again, um, we would like, we want to be a consistent in collaboration with Fish and Wildlife Service and with our own regulations and just move this species from um, a protected status that it is at the state level and bring that in line um, with our with the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service and listed as an endangered species. The Fish and Wildlife Service will still take the lead, you know, because of the way we've managed bats, we give the lead to the federal agency. There's that national coordination, but it, it's a matter of consistency here. But it also does, and, and Greg can mention this a little more, there, there's some real advantages for us to do so. We have a long-standing um, agreement with the Fish and Wildlife Service called the Section 6 Agreement. In fact, the non-game programs started when the Endangered Species Act was formed and the Section 6 agreement was established. Um, and, and what I'm talking about will, sh will come into play a little bit more for the non-federally listed bats. But by bringing ourselves in a line, we're also aligning ourselves with the federal service. And there is some indication that as they dole out federal monies for endangered species, they look at the states and, and ask, are the states doing everything they can to protect the species? Well, we do a lot. I'm not, I would never charge Greg with not doing everything imaginable. But, but without listing, 
there is some assessment that we won't receive the Section 6 funds that we would otherwise. And that really became clear to me as I was at a meeting last week with the service, and they showed that state's actions. So we're really bringing ourselves in a line for that sake as well. Um, state listing also enables us to protect this species in a couple situations where the federal act doesn't because of the 4D rule. But overall, um, we do see um, you know, an appropriate response. I think <coughs> traditional, you see the slides many times, maybe populations go up and down a little bit, but we all do know that this story is well told that um, they've just been a bottom out um, of the populations since when those came in. So that's the recommendation to bring it to the endangered species list. The final two bat species I'll mention, again, recommendations for endangered status, uh, because of the same scenario. This is not federally listed, although it is petitioned for federal listing. And here, state action can really be used. Now, there's no guarantees the service isn't going to go forward. But when they see most states that support um, little brown bats listing them in their own states, uh, they see that action and they see that much of the protection that could be done is being done. And that is weighed as part of the petition review, which will be coming up in a few years with the, with the service as they go through a lot of petitions. So, of course, the declines that have been demonstrated many times match and meet the definition of endangered species. So, to be consistent with the title, uh, Title 58, we believe this is the right thing to do. But we also believe that by elevating its attention, we can give, give these bats more recognition. We can work with landowners, uh, with homeowners. Um, nowadays, there's very few little brown bats in, in homes or buildings. Uh, when you see bats, and this is for the public, when you see a bat flying around at night, it's almost always a big brown bat, which has not declined as much. But still, the educational opportunities that were mentioned earlier uh, will really be enhanced when we say, yes, this species population has crashed. And we recognize that by endangered status, and now we work with people. And of course, I think you understand that the state, the, the environmental review process that we use are very flexible. We work with industry. Um, we don't do blanket protections of mass habitats like that, like that is done at the federal level. Something else that was mentioned. We work on the specific locations of known individuals to make sure that those few individuals that we have can survive and maybe bring a recovery down the line. So that those comments will follow my next one. But again, the population trends. I think I used the same slide in um, August, was it that, that we presented and again, pointing out. You know, we went from hundreds of thousands counted. <coughs> hundreds of thousands counted down to maybe a few hundred. The population is the most severe decline of any natural widespread population that I've ever seen in my career, and we hope we'll never see ever again. And how often do we actually go from just being a protected species to endangered without you know, the first time we just around and work on our way? That's a good question, yeah, because there is sort of a sense of progress. Um, Probably it's it's not the norm. Normally, if you see things decline, you put it to a threatened level. But I think the, the nature and scope of the collapse over a short window of time, you know, basically forces us to move right to the most severe condition. Um, I will say that from a practical standpoint, the way uh, the environmental review process happens, the danger and threat are more um, biologically based than they are practically. And we still we treat them largely, or the environmental review community, which we you know, you oversee, treats those two groups fairly similarly. And the definitions are pretty simple. It's like, is the species at risk of disappearing? That's endangered. And it is the species at risk of becoming threatened. That's threatened. And well, this is at, at literally at risk of dis not only disappearing from Pennsylvania, but becoming extinct, which is just a mind-boggling concept. But yeah, but that progress is a good thing to point out. Yes, there is intended a, a representation of the status. So the final species was mentioned earlier, the tricolored bat, or, or, or tricolored pipistrel. Um, 
um, recommending in danger because of that severe decline. Um, the decline it is not quite as severe as the little brown, but again, we have these very substantial counts, good, solid data for both species. But the decline is very similar, and again, the, the trend, you'll see that catastrophic drop off from counting thousands down to counting almost individuals. So um, these species uh, are following a similar track, um, and we felt, we really do feel that the only responsible thing is to do is to give them the status that represents their population. Now this is a little rough, but um, I want to throw up a draft regulatory guidance that's been um, proposed as we're working with the Environmental Review, our staff, but Greg, and he could speak to it in more detail, has also been reaching out to industry groups. We recognize that there will be some, they will have to consider the species, the coal industry and the fork and the forest and energy industries. But I'll, I'll just point out the, the guidance that we're going to provide the environmental review community, the group that actually performs this, is really intended to focus in on the specific sites. For instance, only verified breeding and non-breeding sites, in other words, maternity and hibernacular, that have been occupied since white nose came in will be included in the PNBI review. So in other words, we're not taking all the historic records for white, for middle brown and tricolor bat, throwing them into PNBI, so you have to, you get a hit every time a bat was present before white nose. I'm sorry, the bats aren't there anymore. And our intent here with the review process is to focus just on those places where we know they still occur. So since 2012, since the decline, so it's a much smaller number, of course, um, to create a 300 meter buffer around the sites um, for the review process. And then the review commute that, you know, staff can boil it down and look at, that just gets us uh, in the door to talk to folks. And then they can look down and see what the activities are um, and determine whether there'll be any impact at all. Um, the, the, the activities that would impact a species, this is true for every, um, every species, but it's narrowed down to those window of seasons, seasonal activities, where we know if you, um, you disturb them at this time, you're going to have an impact. So the maternity window and the hibernacular window. So all, all efforts, it's partly a workload matter, but it's really, the real focus is to focus in on the activities that we know, if they go forward, they will further impact highly degraded species. We don't want that to happen, and we'll work with them. So, more questions are welcome. Um, we can share some of the materials that have been distributed, and we're still in the work, in the process of finalizing the review guidance. We'd we'll be glad to take input. So, from a very quick overview, you'll see um, my little stair steps, which is helped to visualize for me, extirpated at the bottom. It's really bad. It's gone. And as we see progress, we move up the steps towards recovery. And that's our goal. That's our goal. We want species that are thriving in the environment. We don't want endangered species. We want to bring them out of that. And I'm very gratified through my career with eagles, osprey in the past, moving forward with peregrines. We're actually seeing that, that labor. I mean, it's decades. But it's very rewarding as a professional to see, yeah, it is possible. You've heard me say that when we talked about eagles. Man, you know, when I started, we probably didn't have that in our mind. We just thought these species were rare. But guess what? They can recover. We have to maintain that optimism. Bats will be a long haul, but eagles were 40 years too. So let's let's have that long haul and really work it. So I'll step you through very quickly. Six changes. Peregrine falcon moving up the steps from endangered to threatened. Piping plover moving up the steps from extirpated to endangered. It was a great story to have them back. Red knot, moving it from, in, in, at the state level, it was just, it was protected, but we are moving it down to threatened. The species is in trouble. And the long-eared bat, which from the state level, it was at a protected status. Of course, it had been federally listed. We're moving it down to endangered, and, and um, Commissioner Daly, that, that big step, you don't, you don't see that too often, but I think we do, um, we will make the case, uh, well, we have made the case. Similarly for Little Brown, um, state protected to endangered in the tricolor bat. 
protected and endangered. So just very briefly, again, celebrating the successes that we've had with the birds that are recovering. And, and tell that good story that yes, management can be successful for, for all these species. We're acknowledging and moving forward with these recommendations our trust responsibility. Recommending downgrades for bats and birds when needed to establish that trust responsibility to the public that we're doing what we need to to conserve these species. Um, taking your recommendations, you know, this there's a there's a standard operating procedure guidance on how do we go forward with this and we follow that, including using some of the using your public input tools, um, advancing both the scientific community that supports this and in compliance with the federal section six agreement. Um, but in the end, in the end, yes, there will be some. We don't anticipate significant conflicts and certainly not significant economic impacts due to these new um, these new listings, in particular because there are relatively few locations. That's why we call it endangered. It's um, and, it, and our activities are focused on those particular sites. So this is our recommendation. We appreciate your consideration of this, recognizing um, you know that it's a tough thing to advance new listings, um, but we really focused in on those we believe we must advance. So thank you so much for your attention. Any questions? Yeah, I have. I know there were some concerns from outside the agency about the law. Did we work through all those issues? Are we in a, are we in a happy place right now? Well. You know, I guess, and not to be smart, but uh, as happy as you can be with the species that's at the brain station, you know, form the most common. And I, I, I'll let Greg provide a few more particular details. So with the, um, the process that was recommended in advancing topics to the board, we've, in, we've undertaken that. We, uh, we identified uh, the, the review recommendations and begun making calls. And um, Greg has informed me that each of those calls with the coal industry, with energy, with forestry, a couple of them haven't gotten back to us, but they first of all appreciated the fact that they got a call. You know, they didn't read it in the paper. Um, so we're giving folks a head up, heads up. And we're also talking through the difference between federal and state and recognizing, quite frankly, somewhat limited tools that we have at the state level. It's not a broad brush like the federal listing. And, and Greg can comment to it, but I think you'll, I, we're very gratified uh, with that process, the bringing industry along with us, as it were. Uh, recognizing they're going to get a few hits. There's going to be a few hits out there, but the hits will be for the sole purpose of conserving those remaining individuals. Understanding the Fish and Wildlife Service will proceed as it feels it must with the federal listed species. So, yeah, I, I, I think we're moving forward. I'll just say also, for those who were around five, six years ago when we had a public forum, there were a lot of folks in the room expressing their concerns. Um, we had a couple positive comments here. Industry, both in the newspaper, read the, the agenda of the meeting. I saw paper, uh, articles on Friday. But then also the calls that Greg made. Industry's been given notice that this is happening. They're not here. It says a lot. And I think the history, we've had six, how many years? It's been 10 years. We've had 10 years of white notice. Everybody's like, oh crap, this is bad. You know, even if they feel a little pinch, they're saying, this is bad. They've got, everybody has to do their part. So, so should we be moving to protect more of the bat species that are left than we are today? Because like, I, I mean, we have houses, people have bats in their houses, and a lot of them do damage and harm the, harm the bats in the removal process <coughs> instead of I don't think we're educating enough people. You know, there's proactive things. There's simply positive things that I appreciated the comment earlier about education. You know, it's, it's not funny, it's sad. 15 years ago, I was driving somewhere, it was a Halloween, and I heard the guy on the radio talking about using your, your tennis racket on the bats in your house. I mean, I heard that on the radio. Um, I don't think anybody, you know, even a, a, a DJ who's trying to get a laugh is going to hold something like that at this point. So there has been a change in perspective. Absolutely, we can work with individuals. And, and we have many surveys that are partly designed to count bats, but they're also designed to reach the public. The summer bat camps, you know, where we go, we go and sit outside somebody's barn 
Well, believe me, we've had a conversation with that man. Though. We don't sit outside his barn without talking to him. So that process, we gather some data, we talk to people. There's a lot of education. And we work well with the IME department in reaching this story out. And you know, quite honestly, I think on a press release that says, we put these on an endangered species list, that's a big message, too. So yeah, I appreciate that. Um, in terms of are there other species that need listed, we use a pretty rigorous biological assessment. Um, Greg could, could correct me, but and there's, there's um, migratory bat species that get hit by wind. We don't have the data for that. Little uh, Big browns aren't as bad off. We have data. So I don't think there's other. I'm not like stacking up next next meeting. I'm not going to have a bunch more species. This, is, this took a long time to get to this point. And these are the ones that we really believe require this action. But I, I really appreciate the question. So I, I just think that we should be proactive with the bats that we have left. Um, we, we do know, know that there's an uh, ecological problem that's being created. Uh, there are a tremendous amount more insects that we noticed this year with uh, mosquitoes and the wet, you know, the wet you know, amount of rain that we've had and the wet problems that we have around. Um, so I don't know that, that getting the ants around there uh, and trying to protect some of the species that are left in the state may not be in the future something that we have to do. Well, the wisdom of Greg's talk coming after mine now comes in because he can talk about a lot of proactive things. And you've seen it before, and it's it's I mean, it's really neat to see. So yeah, he'll be able to flesh out some of those proactive things that we're doing. How much of an overlap, Dan, is there in the habitats? So if I can protect these three species, you may be doing some of what Mr. Hoover saying because there's an overlap in hibernacula and, and other areas that multiple species might inhabit, is that true? Um, yeah, and Greg is probably just chuckling to see how I handle the back questions. Because, <laughs> you know, quite frankly, okay, I oversee that program. I trust these guys to do their work. I'll say at least, clearly, the winter sites, there's, they, they winter together. But um, by and large, the summer locations are kind of distinctive, aren't they? Um, I'm not going to just kick it to Greg, but you know the good detailed questions about bat biology. Here's the expert. But yeah, but there's there's a, a double, and you know even the that federal listing, the Fish and Wildlife will act to protect certain species. There's an umbrella effect for sure. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we'll go straight to Greg's talk. Um, the requested presentation on, um, on more uh, proactive and research and management activities to get us focused on white nose. You're, we're really privileged um, to have an international expert in our staff. And that's been a long time. Calvin Skosky, you know, came up through the ranks and, and really learned this stuff, passed the mantle of Greg. We have a an expert published on the developing the research tools, but also that hands-on management. So that's about the pitch that I'll make for Greg. And, uh, oh yeah. <laughs> uh, President Lane, board, Director Burnham, and executive staff, uh, thank you. Uh, it's my privilege to be back uh, to give an update on white nose syndrome. Uh, and since we have several new commissioners, I thought I would give a little bit of a brief background that I know some of you have seen before. Uh, but uh, basically, in Pennsylvania, we have six species of bats that hibernate underground, which means they're spending six months of the year in a state that is metabolically reduced, with a breathing rate is suppressed, the in, uh, immune response is, re is repressed. And of those six species, we have two that are federally listed, the two you see outlined in red. The long-eared bat is federally threatened, and the Indiana bat is federally endangered. Uh, we have the state-threatened small-footed bat in orange, uh, which is a species that has always been very rare in the state, and we only find around very specific small habitat, uh, which is specifically the talus slopes, the very rocky, cliffy type areas that we have. Uh, and do not comprise a, a large degree of habitat in the state. And then we have the two species in blue, uh, which Dan has talked about, are proposed for state listing, but are also proposed for federal listing. 
the uh, little brown bat, which was once our most common bat in the state, and the tricolored bat. Um, it's so named because the fur actually has three different colors from the base to the tip. Um, and one of our smaller bats. So these are our six hibernating bats. Um, as Dan mentioned, we do have migratory species of bats, uh, which do not hibernate. They fly south for the winter. Uh, and so those are not um, something we're going to discuss much here today. But as far as bats go, spending time underground, uh, not any hole will do. I've had several conversations with people here today about how many holes there truly are out there. And it doesn't take much walking around to find that there are coal mines and limestone mines and drillings for gas. Uh, everywhere you go across the state, there are some holes in the ground. Um, but not every hole for bats will do. So if you just have a general hole in the ground, the average temperature of our ground is about 53 degrees Fahrenheit. And bats do not care for such sites. They want cold sites, these cold air traps, we call them. And for that, you need a site that has some slope so that the cold air, which is more dense, can flow to the bottom and push that warm air back out. And over years, those sites can cool down. And the sites that we find our bats hibernating are generally around 45 to 50, 49 degrees. Uh, we do get a couple that will be up in the 50s, <coughs> the low 50s. But for that 44 to 49 degrees, really the sweet spot of where bats like to hibernate. Um, and right before white nose syndrome came, we actually had an opportunity with some mitigation to try and experiment. This is a game lands down in Fayette County uh, where it has four mine openings, three of which are very large, and then one smaller one, which you can see the bulldozer there kind of plowing some rocks up. And we had some um, uh, detonation occur in front of those that caused that rock to come up, and then we pushed that rock up there. And the goal was to try and create a way to, to pool and, and uh, capture all of the cold air that's in that site. As you can see, we gated those sites to keep people out. So two major things were accomplished here, keeping the disturbance level down, uh, because the bats that are hibernating there don't like repeated visits by people, uh, and then keeping those cold air temperatures inside. And as soon as we did that, if you look at this graph, the take home is that for 20 years, we had hardly any bat use. But the second that we got the people out and cooled that site down, the bat temperatures, or the bat temperatures, the bat numbers and the diversity of bats in that site started to grow. And this is probably the first time this has ever actually been done um, for the sake of bats. It may have happened accidentally through some mining practices, but uh, this was the first time that anyone actually experimented with trying to change the temperatures in a mine just for the sake of bats. And it worked, and it was pretty neat. Uh, but unfortunately, as has mentioned, this disease came. Um, so this is a, a picture that made it in the National Geographic where I was actually pulling out a cluster of about 300 dead bats uh, with the photographer that was there. Um, and this was one of our first sites that hit in the Northeast, uh, up near Hazleton. And we were getting calls from car dealerships and other entities where bats were just flying around and flying into their businesses and saying, hey, what can you do about this? Well, unfortunately, there wasn't much we could do about it. It's a pathogen that was killing millions of bats. Um, and what this pathogen does, this is a fungus that comes in. And this fungus actually digests the live cells of the wing membrane. It doesn't tend to uh, impact the skin that, that is furred and has uh, hair growing out of it. So the wings and bats in particular are vulnerable. And it's what we call a cold-loving fungus. So when these bats come in to hibernate, they drop their body temperature down to that 45, 50 degree temperature that the bats are hibernating in. And that is the temperature that this fungus likes to grow. And it comes in, the spores germinate on the skin, they send in a little mycelial growth and then they start growing and digesting this live living bat. And where you see these long arrows pointing to, they're pointing to actual wounds where this fungus has come in, it's replicating and just packing full in those little openings where it's digesting the bat in order to fuel its own growth. And what you may end up having are thousands and thousands of these wounds across the wing membranes of these bats. Well, that obviously would not be very comfortable, and, and 
one of my colleagues and I quickly deduce that probably what's happening with these bats is that these wounds are causing them to come out of hibernation more than they should. Well, a small little bat that's about seven grams has about one gram of fat in order to eat <coughs> through the entire winter, six months without eating. And to do that, they have enough energy to come out of hibernation a set number of times, about 14, 15 times for a healthy bat. You now add in a disease that's causing them to come out of hibernation too many times, about twice as many times, they're gonna run out of that fat supply about halfway through winter, which causes them to come out in the middle of winter where there's no food available, and they're gonna either freeze to death or be predated or die in some other manner. And I won't get into a lot of the data, but just to demonstrate how severe this is, this is a site that had about 35,000 bats. Uh, there was a couple of years where we didn't go in because we didn't know what the pathogen even was that was causing this disease. Um, and so we stayed out to try and you know, prevent anything from happening. But when White Nose got, went there, we went in, and immediately within one year, we had a 99% decline. We went from about 35,000 counted bats down to 72 bats. Um, when we look at this, and the question was earlier, does this affect all species? And it does affect all of the species we have at Hibernate, but two of them are doing fairly well. One is that small-footed bat, which is rather rare and, and is not captured or found very often on our landscape. But it seems fairly tolerable from what we can tell. And the other is the big brown bat, which is doing well. So our focus is not really on those two species. It is on these other four species for that reason. And one of the other points I'll bring about is when we look at these bats on the summer landscape, what we can notice very quickly just from looking at this graph is that basically the only thing left on our landscape at this point that is found are big brown bats. We just don't see the captures of little brown bats by contractors. So for example, with little brown bats, in the last three years, with about 1,500 surveys per year across the state, there has been one little brown bat captured by those roughly 5,000 surveys. So uh, they are very rare on the landscape. All right, so, so you know, clearly there's an issue, um, but our focus has never really been just to document the sad story and the decline. Uh, we've collected a lot of data along the way, and um, our focus was really on the survivors. And so this simple graph uh, is something unique that came out. So some of the sites we've monitored for over 20 years, and those bats came in in the fall to get them ready to hibernate at the same body mass every year for 20 years. And all of a sudden, the year after white nose came in, those adults that actually managed to survive almost doubled their body mass. Uh, individuals that actually were banded at seven and a half grams before white nose, we captured a year or two later at 14 grams. And so in 20 years of, of working at this site before white nose syndrome, we never caught a bat over 10 grams. So these actual individuals were like, whoa, what happened? That was really bad. I don't know how I made it out of there, but I know I was arousing too many times out of hibernation, and I need more body mass, more fat. And we did it right away. The problem with that is that the juveniles didn't experience this. So they don't know that they need that extra energy stores, and therefore the juveniles are not doing as well, and they are not doing that same body mass. But I think it's actually kind of fascinating that these adults were actually able to do that and do it so quickly. So they have these mechanisms to adapt and try and deal with this pathogen. One of the other techniques which I've presented in the past about um, is we developed this novel technique using UV light to illustrate where the infection is in the bats and to actually quantify how much they have. And if we take a digital photograph of that, we can then run this through a computer program and using the actual pixels of the camera, of the, of the photograph, we can tell that program, hey, I want you to highlight all those certain color spots, and we can quantify how much infection that, that actually has. And we've been doing this for about 10 years now, since whiteness has come about. And uh, one of the things that's really interesting is looking at the population over time. 
if you look on the far left of the graph, when white nose first came, about 50% of the wing membrane was covered in infections. So when these bats heal, um, they were able to basically wall off that infection and then they slough off that, that area that's infected. Well, they're losing 50, 60% of their wing membrane when they do that. So they may have survived white nose syndrome that first year, but then they have no wing membrane left to fly and to feed in the spring. And they could theoretically at that point starve to death as well. But the point with this graph is that within just a few years, if you look where it says B there, five years, within five years we went from 50% of the wing membrane infected down to about 10% of the wing membrane infected. And so this is really exciting and good news. We don't have any clue as to why that's happening yet, but we're working on it. Um, and where we want to get to is the far right of this graph, where it says the letter C there. Um, that is our European bats, which we know don't die from white nose syndrome in any mass mortality phase. So we're approaching that pretty rapidly. So there is some sense for hope that a recovery can occur, uh, and that these bats, if we can get the juveniles to survive, uh, that these populations will stabilize and start to recover. Greg, you said that's European ones? Um, the European would be the letter C. But right? that's where white nose was first detected, right? White nose was first detected in Albany, New York. And yeah, subsequent, yeah, and subsequent to that, the Europeans started looking for it and found it. We've now found, we, the collective white nose community, I had no part in this, uh, but, um, well, maybe I did with the UV light. They started using the UV light <coughs> technique and finding that it was a lot of bat species all over Europe, all over Asia, all have it. So um, they found it in Mongolia, and China, and Israel, Russia, you know, a number of all of Europe, basically. So, you know, as I said before, our goal really wasn't to just document the decline of these species, but we really wanted to see, you know, what is it we can do for these species. We've had a lot of data on these bats, and uh, and wanted to see are there anything that we can do that could obviously help them. Well, you know, I'm not too. Uh, uh, ashamed to take the easy cherry picking things first. And really we know that this disease is causing these bats to come out of hibernation too often. We know, I know from doing these surveys, that all I have to do is walk underground and these bats start coming out of hibernation. And I'm disturbing them just by counting them. So we don't want the general public going in, you know, with their lights, talking, smoking cigarettes, lighting fire, shooting bullets around, whatever they do underground, and believe me, they do all of those things. Um, we can keep them out, and if we can keep them out, then uh, especially the very targeted few specific sites. Now, we talked about how many holes are under the ground already. There's about 4,000 to 5,000 abandoned mine openings in the state. There's 2,000 plus natural caves, railroad tunnels. You know, you start naming it, there's thousands of sites. The bats are only using a very specific subset of those, and even beyond that, there's very few survivors that are left. So we can just pick a handful of sites that are our most important sites and try and gate those sites to keep people out. Uh, we've worked with law enforcement to use trail cameras and real-time uh, cameras to monitor and, and deal with the people that are going past our restricted signs, breaking through our gates just to go in and disturb these bats. Uh, and uh, we've gated a, a good number of those sites, and uh, as per the strategic um, plan, we've exceeded that goal already by far. Uh, one of the other things we've noticed in monitoring these survivors, specifically when we were looking at where these survivors was that were at, uh, we noticed that there were certain sites that they were never in before because they were just too cold. And now they're starting to appear in those sites. The few sites that remained that had bats before white nose syndrome and had them afterwards, the bats weren't in the same places. They had moved to these really cold areas. Um, and we know through some previous literature that when bats are at colder temperatures, they don't come out of hibernation as often, which means they're saving energy. So a bat strategy in the beginning of winter when it has all the body fat it needs is I'll be in a warmer area and I'll come out of hibernation more frequently, but as I need to conserve energy, I'll shift and move to these colder places. 
Well, if the survivors are choosing those colder sites, there must be a reason why. And lo and behold, uh, someone actually in the lab looked at the growth of this fungus. So as soon as we identified this as the pathogen, he said, okay, what temperature does this fungus grow at? And so here you can see um, the general temperature of where bats like to hibernate. The range of that temperature is what's between these red bars here. And if you look at that solid brown line there, you'll notice that is the actual Pennsylvania isolate, which has the highest growth rate during this hibernation period in that temperature ring the bat likes to hibernate. So it's no surprise to me that our mortality of little brown bats is actually a little bit greater than New York and some of these other states. But the point being is why are bats choosing colder sites? Well, if they're choosing sites that are now in between these blue bars, it's pretty obvious. And the bats themselves figure this out, right? The fungus grows slower. The pathogen that is attacking them doesn't grow as fast, so it doesn't spread as fast between individuals. If they get it, they don't get as much infection, which means they don't burn as much energy. And naturally, they have that natural mechanism to not come out of hibernation as much. So they are saving more energy by picking these colder sites. Well, to come back, I brought this slide up earlier, but these cold sites are the ones that they like multiple openings, they have some slope to it. And this is a small subset of the total number of sites out there. But the ones that they're now picking that are like really super cold, just above freezing, 38 to 40 degrees, there's only a handful of them out there on this on the landscape across the whole state. So we decided to see if we could actually mimic that. We had an opportunity with some funding. We had a site here that was located centrally in the state and it had one opening. And we went in with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Partners Program, and my uh, colleague and I, we rappelled 100 some feet down this air shaft, got in, did a little tape and compass measurement to where we thought the original opening was, came above ground, walked that off in the exact same spot, and we found a couple of rocks sitting there on the side of the slope, and we said, dig here. And they said, okay, and they dug and they dug, and after a few days of digging, they were about 30 some feet down and they came across the original opening, which we now, as you can see, is gated. And we created this big sinkhole opening <coughs> where now in the winter, all that cold air, like a funnel, just goes right down there and blows in there and blows all that hot air out that back air shaft. And this site, which used to be about 53 degrees year round, and we hardly ever had bats, we now can bring that site when the bats are hibernating down to about 40 degrees, which is what they are looking for. So then the question is, well, will the bats find it? Will they know it's colder? And how will they do? Well, just like that Caspera site we showed you in Fayette County earlier, as soon as we put that bat gate in, the number of bats as well as the diversity of bats started to increase. So we think we're actually on to one of the first management techniques that can actually benefit these bats. And we've presented this at the National White Nose Syndrome meetings, and lo and behold, there's a lot of actual national support for this now. Uh, Connecticut actually is mimicking us and has put in their first attempt at cooling a site down, and several other states are interested in trying this as well. One of the things I haven't talked much about to most folks uh, in the community of, of with bats trying to keep a little bit of a lid on this until I feel a bit more confident about it. But when we started examining some of the bats in these colder sites, you look at the UV on this bat, the fluorescent yellow-orange areas, and you don't see very much. So this is a bat that was hibernating at 40 degrees, and this goes to show us that they are not getting the level of infection that the bats at 44 to 48 degrees are getting. Um, and so that's uh, a, a good positive sign for us to hang our hat on there as far as uh, manipulating some of these sites. And we've uh, now manipulated a, a couple other sites in Fayette County, and we are currently working with this site here. Um, this is a site that we were able to um, uh, use the Indiana Bat Conservation Fund to acquire. This is a decommissioned commercial cave. This is a site that used to have thousands of Indiana bats hibernating in it until they built this giant concrete building right over the opening, which sealed up the air temperatures, which warmed it up, which obviously limited bat access to the site. 
Um, we now have an old sinkhole in the back which I had contractors dig all of the rock out and put a three foot diameter pipe in there so we can now vent the heat out of there. And we ripped apart the face of the building and now have a nice back gate right in front of that. And this site slopes all downhill. So this site right now is starting to pool that cold air in there and is open for bats to now go back in. Uh, so very exciting and we're hoping that within a year or two years, we'll be able to start to see a similar graph to what we had at that other site. Um, the third and last thing I'll talk about as far as some of our adaptive management options, um, we've tried a number of different uh, treatment techniques. A lot of things that kill this fungus in the lab, turns out they actually kill the bats when they're hibernating faster than the disease does. Uh, I learned that, uh, unfortunately, very quickly, one of the first things we tried was spearmint oil. So you know, you think of spearmint gum, right? Well, there's a chemical called carbone that's what they put in the gum to give it that spearmint flavor. And we found in the lab that just the vapors of that oil is enough to stop fungus from growing and kill it. We thought, ah, we'll just put this you know, underneath the bats. It'll evaporate and coat the bats and they'll never have any fungus growing on them. Unfortunately, um, spearmint oil was enough to disturb the bats enough that they actually perished as well. And that was back in 2009 when we tried that. So we've been in the game of trying to find something uh, that would work that will help these bats. <coughs> this is the sub substance that we're hanging our hat on today. It's called polyethylene glycol 8000. So it's a simple, small little carbon molecule reiterated 8000 times, which makes, makes it a very huge molecule. <coughs> And it's a non-toxic substance, and it's used all over the place. All right, every medication, toothpaste, all have it. Meats and other things you buy in the supermarket are coated with it. Why? To keep fungus from growing. And what this stuff does is it actually sucks up water and holds it. So you can have the fungi, which are very water stressed. If you have, if you dry anything out, fungi won't grow in it. They're very sensitive to how much moisture is in the air. That's why you see mushrooms grow in spring after it rains, right? It's dark and it rains, and that's when those mushrooms come up. Well, this is no different. And so this substance will actually trick the fungus into thinking it's dry. It could be floating in water, but if it's coated in this stuff, it thinks it's dry and it just doesn't grow. So it's not a toxic substance. It's not what we would call a biocide. It's killing the fungus. You could take that spore out of the PEG environment and it'll just start growing again. But what we've done uh, is we tried a trial experiment where we had a cage and we sprayed it down and we put these bats in there and we had a control cage and the bats in the control cage, as we expected, got covered in the pathogen. This is a, in January after just a few months, halfway through. The bats that were sprayed down with the PEG 8000 not a single one of them developed a single point of lesion of infection. Um, so that gave us some hope. Uh, we spent the next two years jumping through hoops. Uh, EPA clearance to spray down a site, PSA clearance, historical clearance, you name it. We went through those hoops. We got funding from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And um, as of November this year, I'm proud to say that Cebula Railroad Tunnel in Clearfield County is now sprayed an entire one mile section with this new leaf, uh, mosquito fogger, uh, where we sprayed this sucker down uh, with the highest concentration of PEG. So we're anxiously awaiting March to come to see if we were actually able to inhibit or break that cycle of infection with the bats. Um, so this is a site that actually has little brown bats recovering. The number of bats have been growing in the site. And uh, right now, what we're really hoping is that this is going to help the juveniles survive in this site. And we're going to see some positive growth uh, from this point forward with this site. Uh, and with that, I would like to thank many of my colleagues from all over the world um, and here at home as well. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take those. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, I don't know exclusively, but I have a very good uh, answer for you. Uh, there's a recent publication.
publication that came out that showed that free fatty acids um, can actually inhibit the fungus from growing. Um, and there are a whole host of free fatty acids that are sebaceous glands as mammals will exude. Um, big browns have two different types of free fatty acids that they exude out of those sebaceous glands that inhibit the fungus, um, whereas little brown bats and tri-colored bats, um, they do not have much of that, if any at all. And so they have other ones which unfortunately don't inhibit the growth of the fungus. One more question. In, in Europe, the, in these other countries, can we get populations defined as a result of like most, or are they stable? Or are they uh, well, the populations are stable. So in Pennsylvania, we had sites with 100,000 bats. I've seen sites that had close to a million bats in them before white nose syndrome. What we would call large sites, 100,000 plus. A large site in Europe is 1,000 bats. So to put it in perspective, they don't have these mega huge sites like we used to have. Uh, we don't know what the po bat populations were like before white nose syndrome came. We know from a museum specimen in Europe that they had white nose syndrome over 100 years ago. So it's been there for a century. Um, they've had time to adapt to it. Um, we don't know exactly all those adaptations, um, but it's likely some species were lost in Europe and we just don't know. For us here, yes. Um, the vast majority of them are in caves and mines, um, but small-footed bats. Um, we're pretty confident we'll use these talus slopes in the winter as well. So some of these talus slopes are, if you want to imagine, a, a steep slope of a mountain with 30 to 40 feet deep of the big boulders all laying on top of each other. They can get way, way down in there, where the temperatures are actually fairly stable. Um, and little brown bats, or not little brown, long-eared bats are now suspected of doing much of the same. So we have in hibernation sites with long-eared bats a 99.9% decline just like little browns. But the summer landscape decline took longer to get into the 90th percentile range. So it took longer because we think they're hibernating in some of these more alternative sources. So. Uh, in deep in tree roots are some examples in stone foundations of old buildings. Um, and in New York City, uh, actually in the city, there's a population of long-eared bats that's been persisting. And they find, they're finding them hibernating in the basements of some of the homes where they're crawling through the rock foundations and getting into people's basements to hibernate. Uh, and so they're likely more or less avoiding hibernation in that regard and therefore it's taking longer for them to become exposed. So we saw a slower decline in the landscape with that species, but that has been catching up. Yes? Uh, my question is, have we worked with the EP to figure out where all the old logger mines are? And I'm assuming most of them probably went up and keep the water under control, but it, it seems like some of them would have done exactly what you tried to do with the, the downward slope, and if you were able to then vent that create that uh, flow that you've been able to do great. Um, do we have their database? And, and is there anything out there we can work with? Well, DEP has all of their abandoned mines right. on the website. Right. Um, don't like promoting that too often because there's a subset of people who like to go into those mines and find them. Most of them probably already know that, though. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, then it comes down to the slope. And that all depends on the geology, what they're going for. Um, so you're absolutely accurate that a lot of the mining techniques were to try and mine uphill so that water would run out. Um, but we do find some of the most um, ancestral mines, if you will, the older mines, they were just going in for the ore, whatever it was that they were going for. And so a lot of them actually went downhill. And in, and in certain circumstances, they had to follow the slope of, of the ore that, that themselves. So we do have a number of them. It's a smaller subset that go downhill. Um, the vast majority of them go up here. But that's why most sites don't work all that well. But those mine locations and DEP, they don't necessarily know the slope of the mine. You have to get into the mine maps. And, and that's very cumbersome and it takes a lot of work and digging all of those mine maps up. And, you know, 
Yeah, so, so to answer your question, uh, we haven't really worked with DPP to find actual sites of, of potential to do this with. We've been more or less focused on verifying that it's a solid technique to try. And when we can feel more confident with that, then I think it's worth exploring and moving forward. And maybe even bringing in some of the mining industry at that point to then talk, because they have experts that know how to manipulate airflow. I mean, I, I try and pride myself on doing a little bit there, but you know, they have real experts in that field. And I think we could work on you know, lowering humidity and increasing cold airflow into those sites with some real experts, if this actually is a viable technique. Yes. How did you get out? The way I went down. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. So you've got to see some of Greg's YouTube videos and, and watch how he does it. Go you know, on the, the, the Game Commission's YouTube page. And all that. I, I posted some of my Facebook pages. I think they're just, they're just awesome. Good. Any other questions? Greg, any physiological disadvantage to those bathrooms? To double their fat, you know, like <coughs> when human beings are over like this. Shoulder the cardiology. I haven't been measuring their blood. Yeah, you know, it's very difficult to get, you know, it's blood off of a bat. We learned when we started this looking at, we were able to show that these bats are getting dehydrated through some of our other published work. And there's various things going on, but uh, we also know that they're anemic which was something that, you know, when we learned that the fungus, what it was doing was basically trying to rob the iron out of the bat. I thought, oh, well, the first thing it's going to try and rob is the hemoglobin. And so I had a researcher actually <coughs> studying that look at it. And that hasn't been published yet, but yes, these bats are also anemic. And, uh, and so, but in trying to get blood out of a bat, you know, the bats just don't have very much. You know, we can pull out a big tube of blood out of us very easily, and you can run all the tests you want on that. <coughs> You're lucky if you can get a very small little capillary tube filled with bats. Uh, it's quite difficult because they're just so small and tiny. The volume isn't there in order to run these tests very easily. So. But no, I you know I do know that there are, some of these survivors are living ten plus years already. Um, you know, so I like I said I have some banded bats that were banded before white nose syndrome that are still alive. The guys that doubled their fat. Yeah. Yeah, but I don't know if they have diabetes or... <laughs> <laughs> Any others? No. All right. You know, right. I, I think it's important much. to say that the work that Greg's doing is not just helping bats in Pennsylvania, but nationally and internationally. So uh, our hat off to you for all the work that you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Again, we're being told that when, when you speak and you're asking questions, grab a microphone as close to you and get it up to your, yeah. Hey, Greg, uh, I'll try to be um, brief, but not too brief, because I was directed to put some meat into this thing and uh, get into the complexities of it by some of the So, <laughs> make sure we do. <laughs> if I don't want to just stand behind a podium and have to talk from right here, it's kind of awkward, but you know, I like to move around. If you get out of control, Tom's just going to pull you yeah, yeah. That's why he's got me right here. So. <laughs> I got a reputation that bad already, too. Is that, yeah, is yeah. So thanks for uh, having us. My name is Dave Gustafson. I'm the Game Commission's Forestry Program Manager. Um, today with me, I have Paul Weiss, who's a forest program specialist. You'll hear from him on a few slides here as well. I'm just really going to go over kind of an update of the program, where we've been um, in the past, um, where we've been in the recent past, a bunch of changes that have come along, things we've done differently, um, and, and where we're going, and, and the things that we've launched forward here in recent years. Um, one of the things I think it's always important to talk about is the program responsibilities. Um, we'll go through some recent history, new developments, and then other things just besides timber sales, because we do more than that. And this slide here, I always like to throw up um, on the screen for people to look at, and 
Because a lot of times when people think about game commission and forestry, they just think, well, you're the guys that are out there that cut the trees and you know, do habitat work by cutting trees. But there's a heck of a lot more that our staff's involved in uh, than just cutting trees. Um, we, we, we have a lot of um, data collection that goes behind that program to have a good scientific foundation behind what we do. Our foresters help the biologists out with all kinds of surveys, with deer aging. They're highly involved in our prescribed fire program. Um, some of our forestry staff have um, risen up in the qualification levels and prescribed fire to become leaders in the regions and the programs. Um, the forest habitat health measurements and the deer management program, something that we're looking hard at in the next uh, deer plan revision of how we're going to continue that process. Um, forest mapping and comprehensive plans, as you can imagine, with the, the amount of forest land we have on game lands, having those foresters assess that property, inventory it, um, and develop those plans with the land managers and the biologists is, is a critical task. We do a lot of special permits. Um, we get a lot of requests from people to do lots of different things. Um, I have a file drawer in my office of all the different types of research projects that we have permitted out on game lands that have to do with forestry things. It's, it's huge. It's like a big accordion file with all the different things we have going on. Everything from testing hypovirulence on American chestnut fungus um, to uh, looking at beach park disease and all kinds of other things. So we're, we try to cooperate with uh, academia and research to provide opportunities for them to, to do their work. Pest management, um, that's something that ebbs and flows. Um, you know, gypsy moth, everybody knows what gypsy moth is all about, especially out here in this area in Somerset County. has a big history with that. Um, so when, in the years when we have gypsy moth issues, forestry department coordinates our spray program. Um, in the last several years, it's, it seems like the pest du jour. It seems like every time I turn around, there's some new bug that's eating trees or eating plants or, or is otherwise destroying our ecosystem. So um, it's something that's continuing to be a bigger issue. You're going to hear more about that in a few minutes. Uh, forest inventory analysis, we've got a program where we have permanently established locations on the ground on game lands, 865 of them across the network of properties out there, um, that we go back in and in uh, intervals and re-measure those to kind of track the forest health conditions over the long term. Um, and then the Howard Nursery uh, also falls under the forestry program as well, so we've got a lot going on more than just uh, cutting trees out on game lands in the forestry program. Um, where do we do it, and what does the what does our landscape look like? Um, 1.5 million acres. We we were over that mark a couple years ago. Uh, 1.389 roughly is considered forested. Um, so that's the lion's share of our game lands has trees. Yeah, we've got lakes and we've got rivers and, and we've got wetlands and farm ground and things like that. But the the bulk of state game lands is forested. Um, but it's not all forested equally. Um, and how many, how many people in here have heard, you know, oh, you got 1.5 million acres, you should be cutting way more timber because you got all those trees out there. Well, try putting conventional logging operations on some of the ridges in the Ridge and Valley Province in Huntington County or in some of these places in Somerset where you have, you know, near, near vertical slopes. They have trees on them, but you're not going to go harvest them and do any valuable habitat work there by doing it. So um, when we break it all down and look at what our game lands really look like, um, we operationally zone them for, for operational conditions, and if you look, um, I don't know if I have a cursor around here that I can move, you can see, it sure that? No. But on that, the bottom left there is a, a map of the game lands that has the operationally zoned. You see the blue line through the middle is a stream corridor with buffers on it um, for protection of riparian areas. The yellow is uh, <coughs> too steep or too wet. Um, to put conventional uh, logging equipment in there. Um, and the white space is what we would consider conventionally manageable area. So that's that M code, that multiple use. So that's the lion's share of game lands. You know, we, we have a lot of manageable ground out there. But when you look at the forest types that exist on that manageable ground, what you can do with them, we get down to about 750 to 800,000 acres. I have 755 on there. It kind of changes. Um, depending on our acquisitions and management plans and things like that. But that's what we consider our commercially operable forest types in that multiple use zone. So you're you're down significant from that 1.5 million acre number. So I, I, I offer that up for perspective um, when people think about game lands, that we just can't go and do everything we might want to do everywhere we want to do it. We have limitations. Um, so what are, what are we doing with these forests? What do they look like now? What do we want them to look like in the future? Um, what I would give, what we call that manageable age class, what I just talked about, that 800,000 acres or so in that manageable category, this is what that age class distribution looks like today with the best data we have through our comprehensive plans and our GIS. Um, those are 20 year age class increments. So 
the farthest left is 0 to 20 years old, and then all the way up to the last one is 100 plus. And what you can see is if you add those last two bars together, about 60% of our game lands is 60 year, or 80 years old or older for us. And that is not rare across Pennsylvania. Most of Pennsylvania looks like that. The Department of Conservation Natural Resources State Forest looks like that. The Allegheny National Forest actually looks a little, I call it worse, because it's worse for wildlife. When you have 60% of your forested landscape basically in an older forest condition, well, that's a problem. When you only have six or seven percent of it in young forest condition, and we look at all the wildlife that are declining, that are young forest kind of obligate species, things like rough grouse, things like gold wing warblers, things that need that young forest condition, even white-tailed deer, that's their browse. So that's concerning. Um, if we kept doing what we were doing for the last, say, 20 years, averaging the average harvest per year that we've been doing, the orange bars is what we would look like 100 years from now. So when we kind of pulled this data together and started running this, we said, that is really, really, really the wrong direction. So several years ago, when we started running more of this data, and we said, well, okay, now what's it going to take to make it look like that? The green bars. That's what we want. We want a more balanced age class distribution across the landscape where we have equitable acres of forest land in, in, in those age classes. Then you constantly have a pipeline going forward in the future. And you'll see that's just below the 20% mark. So if we can get about 17%, you know, in those young forest age classes in particular, that's really the target where we want to get to. Well, what is it going to take to get there? We've got to increase what we've been doing to somewhere between 13 and 14,000 acres per year um, of total commercial. That's just commercial timber harvesting on that 800,000 acres. Um, and I, I show there that approximate 60-40% split between improvement harvest and regeneration harvest. And that's important because what we do in hardwood forests in Pennsylvania to recreate hardwood forests, well, pretty much the worst thing you can do is just go in there and level it once and walk away and let it start. We've got too many problems with interfering vegetation, invasive species and things like that. We've got to develop that new forest under the old forest first. So we go in there and we conduct what we call shelterwood harvests most often um, before you do a final removal harvest to create that new age class. So we've got to have that in the planning cycle where we have 60% of our acres that we're doing are in that shelterwood condition so that we can build that pipeline of things that are going to come into that new age class. Um, well, how do you get there? We, you know, when, I took, when I came to the Game Commission in 2002 um, and up to about 2010-11, we've been averaging somewhere around 6,000 acres a year of total commercial harvest. Um, there's a couple of things we had to look at. We had to look at our manpower resources and say, well, what can we actually do with what we've got? And we have to look at efficiencies and say, where can we create efficiencies to squeeze more out of what, we're, what we have available? Um, so if you look at this, the blue line, the blue bars represent the acres that we've offered for sale, for timber sales. The yellow bars are the actual harvest acres in those same years. Um, notice they're not all the same. Most of our timber harvests take a two-year contract, sometimes a three-year contract window to complete. So what we offer out for sale in one year doesn't necessarily match up exactly with the harvested acres in the same year. Um, but if you look at about 2011, moving, look at the blue bars. That was about the time when we really started knuckling down and saying we've really got to change things and we've really got to improve our output. So from 2011 until this past year, we've been pretty much on a steady increase. Um, about three years ago, um, it was decided we, we had the funds available to add some forest technicians to our staff. We put six of them out on the ground, and that was the bars you see. <coughs> 2014, 15, 16, that's where you see those big jumps in the blue bars, and now you see the actual harvests starting to finally catch up to that. Um, just this past year, we went back and looked at that six forest technician staff and said, how can we leverage those same funds a little better and maybe make an even bigger impact. So in the spring of 2018 this year, we actually put out 14 forest technician positions. We were able to fill 12 of them. We actually had two that we couldn't fill. We didn't have acceptable candidates for. Um, so for anybody out there that's thinking about going into the forestry profession, there's jobs, get to school, get your two-year tech degree, get busy working for the game commission, we need you. <laughs> Shameless plug. But uh, so that's, 
I mean, really, that, that's one of our biggest challenges right now, um, is finding and recruiting qualified staff and, and getting them out there. So, so we've got 14, well, 12 technicians. We've got some grant-funded technicians from third parties that are providing some, some help to us. Um, so we've got a lot more bodies running around out on the ground. Um, another thing we've done is we've actually made a significant effort to increase the size of our individual projects. So instead of just doing more projects, more timber sales, we're making the footprint of each one of those timber sales bigger and bigger and bigger. That helps us administratively where it, you know, we're, we're near the same number of individual timber sales, but the footprint of each one is bigger. So that's less administrative burden on me dealing with all the contracts and all those issues, um, and, and less burden for our staff in the field wrangling loggers. Um, and it's also given us a, a secondary effect of kind of clustering our footprint on the game lands in the space and time where we can kind of get more browse on the landscape in one local spot to kind of overcome some of the deer impact issues. It's not the, it's not the cure all, but, but it can help. Um, and if you stack, you know, a 300 acre project and then two years later another 300 acre project within the same you know square mile area you can really start to see a change in that local landscape and we know with a local landscape level if we can get 17 percent of our our forest in that 20 years or less age class the deer browse impacts really start to become less noticeable so that's a strategy we've been employing as well so we added some staff um, we, we've, we've found some efficiencies in how we're doing things logistically there's a, a snapshot of what our staffing looks like right now. Um, and we got 12 summer interns back. We've got um, college uh, folks that are in either forestry or wildlife programs that are coming out and working with our forestry staff in those three months of the summer when we've got a real time crunch to get a lot of things accomplished. Um, so having those 12 in summer interns out there, the, te the technicians, hopefully we can get those other two positions filled this next year. Um, that's really going to, I think, help snowball things going forward and get us to that target goal of over 13,000 um, 13, acres per year. Something else we're trying to do is leverage technology. Um, when I first started in the Game Commission, you know, we, everything we did in the field was in a, in a book in my hand. It was a paper tally, a dot tally for trees. I had to come back to the office, collect everybody's cards, you know, use crayons, tally them all up on a calculator, then plug it all into a computer program and spit that out. Um, then I had to get my maps all made by hand. Um, we've come a heck of a long way. Um, we've got a project right now where we fielded ruggedized handheld data collectors um, to our all our forestry field staff, where they can do their GIS work and their timber data collection all integrated into one system in the field on the fly. Now they've got smartphones in their hands that we can enable the Wi-Fi hotspots on. So as soon as they get back to their truck, they bang that data right up to the cloud and it's seamless. So what used to take me three hours sitting in my office now takes a field forester, you know, an additional five minutes um, of time. And so this project is kind of, it's just being rolled out. We, we went through a year worth of development and piloting. It's just now getting pushed out to the guys in the field. Really <coughs> to pull on. There's some hiccups, there's some growing pains, like everything with technology, I think. Um, but we're making some great strides and I'm really excited about it. Um, kind of get into the nuts and bolts a little bit of forest habitat management because I, I think often it's, maybe this is just a personal thing, but I, I think people that aren't foresters don't really understand what we do and you sometimes boil it down to being too, too darn simple. Um, you know, they think, well, you got big trees, just cut big trees and let little trees grow. It's how easy it can be, right? Make some money selling them and you're good to go. Um, but it's really not that simple. I mean, you look at Pennsylvania, you have a lot of different forest types. You have northern hardwood forests, you have mixed oak forests, you got hemlock pine associate forest, you've got dry pine, oak woodland savanna types. You've got a lot of different types of forests out there that take a very different hand in how you manage them. They're on different time scales, they're on different methods. You can open up a cherry maple forest, open up the crown and the canopy and stimulate regeneration and get what you want generally. You do that in an oak forest, you're gonna get a whole lot of things besides oak trees growing, because oak trees like a little bit of shade, they like to grow a little slower. So you really have to pay attention to the different types of silviculture for the different types of forests we're working in to get the habitat results that we want. Um, and that's ever changing. The types of silviculture we're using today are not what they were doing in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, and quite honestly, a lot of those past practices, even though those, those folks that were out there were using the best science available at the time, they've created conditions that are now giving us problems. 
we used to go into our developing forests and thin them out and say, let, let the bigger trees grow a little more, right? And produce more acorns per, per crown area per tree. Well, by doing that, we put light on the forest floor, just enough to get things like striped maple and birch and beech brush and ferns to really start growing. So now we go back into those forests and we look at them and we say, we got a real problem in the understory because if we take these overstory trees off and eliminate that seed source, we're not going to have anything left to grow except straight maple, perch, and ferns. I don't too know too many critters that like that vine. So it's not a judgment being passed on the, the historical practices. It's a recognition of an ever-changing, ever-adapting way of doing forestry and soil culture that we've got to stay in tune with. Um, so changes and things that we're doing going forward, there's a couple. Um, in the world of forestry, we always kind of hung our hat on what we consider desirable outcomes. We have that aging forest I talked about. We have massive amounts of pest and invasive issues coming along. Um, the seed source that we have out there is less and less viable anymore. These trees are old. They're not producing reliable seed crops. They're not regenerating like they used to. We've got cherry, black cherry has all kinds of problems over the northern tier right now where the seed will drop, it'll germinate, and the next year you can't find a seedling. Um, it's, whether it's a fungal pathogen, whether it's a nitrogen in the soil issue with a lack of acid rain, there's all kinds of research being done. But the fact is, we're not getting things to regenerate the way we used to be accustomed to seeing it happen. So we're really looking at changing our mindset to, instead of this, you know, striving for this desirable thing, we may have places where we just have to be happy with something acceptable. And there's a difference there. But across the forestry profession in Pennsylvania, that's that's kind of a hot topic right now. Is aging forests? They're, they're, we have big issues going on. We keep trying for perfection on this small area. We might lose our ability to regenerate a much bigger area to something that's at least acceptable. So there's some mindset change going on, um, and creating some more diversity within our spans. You know, the desire to come back and recreate the same kind of forest you have. You know, hey, we got an oak forest. We want to get an oak forest back. We got a cherry forest. We want to get another cherry forest. That's not natural, number one. It, it's not the natural progression of succession. Um, so you're, you're trying to artificially recreate something on the landscape. And what you're, sometimes we end up doing is we say, oh, we got 70% you know, cherry back where we had 70% cherry before. Well, guess what else you've done? You made that stand a lot more susceptible to disease and pest infestations, because you don't have any diversity. So if you have a, a pest that comes in that loves cherry trees, You've got a stand of forest with 70% cherry trees, what happens? You lose 70% of your over tree. So we're really looking at trying to create more stands that have more diversity of species and complexity and structure. And the word, the, kind of the buzzword of the day on that is resiliency. You'll hear that uh, Nature Conservancy is pushing that message about creating more resilient forests. Um, and we've just got to get more aggressive, especially in those degraded stands. Time, time is running out. Uh, on some of our forested areas. These, these trees are not, you know, multi-hundred year long-lived species in our northern hardwoods. I mean, white oak, yeah, they can live a few hundred years in an undisturbed, you know, environment where they're free of stress. Um, but most of our hardwood forests are in a, in a precarious position right now, and we know what the do-nothing approach will result in. Like I said, that straight maple, that fern understory. You, if you look at the understory, that's what's going to be there if you lose your overstory. You're not going to replant your way to success across the state. It's just not going to happen. So we've got to get a little more aggressive, and, and we know what the future is if we don't do anything. It's, it's predictable, and it's unacceptable. So some of the things we're also working on, leveraging our, our network of forestry professionals across the state, bringing things that they're doing in the northeast part of the state to the northwest part of the state. Silviculture changes a little bit depending on geography. And let's say, hey, let's start doing things in a different order. Instead of trying to eliminate interfering vegetation and then do a harvest, let's do a partial harvest first. Let that seed source of all that undesirable stuff sprout, then come back in and eliminate it. Then we've got our healthy seed source left and a level playing field on the ground. So changing the order and sequence of some silvicultural things is one of the things we're doing. Um, and, and as I said before, changing how we're doing logistics of timber sales on the ground to kind of moderate deer impacts uh, without having to throw fences up all the time. And doing a timber sale, it's a process, not an event. Um, again, it's not just, you know, a forester walks out there and says, this area looks good, I'll hang some flagging around, and we'll call a logging company and come in here and cut the trees. There's a lot that goes into 
putting together a timber sale project. It starts with a comprehensive plan. Doing a protocol to, to gather information about the understory. Do we have desirable regeneration or acceptable regeneration present? Do we have interfering with vegetation and invasive species? Every timber sale we do goes through the PMDI system. You know, you just heard about bats. There's a lot of forestry restrictions that have to do with bats. We have a lot of places, especially where we have Indiana bats, where we're limited to a few months of the year where we can actually go in and harvest timber in the winter in order to protect the summer habitat for bats. So whether it's rattlesnakes, goshawks, bats, whatever the species may be, we do a PDI search to make sure we're doing our best to avoid impacts to those species. Um, Foresters developing their plan, their prescription, called the, the RX development, that's prescription <coughs> development. Going out there on the ground and marking the timber with paint. Who's been on game lands and seen trees look like a barbershop pole? You know, they've got different colors of paint all over, right? Um, there's a method to that madness. Um, it's in our forestry manual, it's standardized. You know, if you see yellow paint, that's trees that we're gonna cut. If you see red paint, that's trees we're gonna save. If you see blue paint, that's usually indicative of the boundary area of the timber store. So there's a method to our madness, and that helps the loggers identify, you know, hey, if I see yellow, I'm cutting those trees. So they know what to do based on that. We, we advertise things on our website. Every timber sale we do is advertised on the Game Commission's website through the information, wildlife information tab. Um, we, we collect a surety bond once we execute a contract. Um, like I said, most of those contracts are two years. Sometimes we extend them. In the last month, I've probably gotten more than a dozen requests from logging companies to extend contracts because this summer has been ridiculous. We, 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 we try to protect the game lands so we don't want loggers running around out there with their equipment where they're going to do environmental damage. So this summer, we've been willing to say, yeah, suspend operations. We'll, we'll give you an extension. You can come back and finish it up in the winter or maybe even next summer. Um, because, it, you know, they're our partners. We can't get done what we want done without the logging community. And we don't want them to push them to be irresponsible. <coughs> um, so, yeah, we're working hard with them to try to give them reasonable extensions and time frames to actually get these projects through the finish line. You know, tracking the, the, the payments and the work and the shutdowns and, and, you know, our hunting seasons, we put a restriction in every timber sale that there's no work on Saturdays starting in October, the first weekend in October, running all the way through the end of January. There's no work during the rifle bear season or the two-week rifle deer season. So we basically shut them down for three weeks for bear and deer season. We got a lot of complaints over the last couple of years, and they keep, seem to be getting louder and more numerous that these loggers are saying, you're already hemming us in, you know, we need that time. And I'm like, look, Game lands are for hunters for those times of the year, and we need to make sure that we don't have conflicts with loggers out there working at the same time guys are hunting. Um, a smart hunter takes advantage of where there's a logging job going on, especially when it's snow for us. If you want a secret tip on where to go with muzzleloader in the late season, go to an active timber harvest because you'll be in. Um, you know, then inspection and bond release. You know, our staff, our foresters are out there looking at these sites, making sure that the loggers are living up to all their contractual obligations to make sure we get a good project done at the end of the day. And if any of you have seen a timber harvest, in the immediate aftermath, it looks pretty rough. And, th and that's part of doing the work we do. Um, but I think if you go back a year later, or two years later, after you see things start to green up, after you see those log leanings come back with a clover on them, after you see that new road that got graded off and stone and the new culverts and things that we do with the timber sales, you can see the real value of our timber sale expands beyond just the revenue and, and just that habitat, but there's, there's impacts beyond that. Um, so the timber sale is the method we use to, to effectuate a big change in our forest, but there's a lot of other things we might do in the life of a given stand of forest. So you've got this new young forest that started growing, um, and, and by year 20, you may have to go in there and do some sort of what we call a cleaning treatment, whether it's our, our habitat crews or our forestry staff going out there and maybe thinning out some of the undesirable vegetation if there's invasives in there, like a lanthus tree or something like that that's competing with, with the trees we want. Um, year 45, we may go back, identify crop trees, and have the habitat crews or contract out folks to come in and release those trees. If we want to increase the crown size of our oaks as they're growing, free them up from competition, um, you know, that might happen. You might come back and do a thinning. We've really gotten away from doing a lot of thinnings over the years, but there's still some stands in some places that benefit from it, particularly things like tulip poplar stands. They really benefit from thinnings to, to re redistribute that growth. Um, 80, year 85 is when you're kind of starting to think about regenerating that stand, potentially. So you may come in and do what we call like a low shade removal, which is taking out that striped maple or that interfering vegetation that you don't want. Um, 
then we may have to do a herbicide treatment. Um, our herbicide program has grown tremendously. When I started here, we were doing statewide about 13, 1400 acres a year. This year, right now, the, the season is just ending here in September. We did about 5,700 acres of herbicide work this year, just under the forestry program. That doesn't count what's going on with the habitat management crews and land managers and, and other programs like that. So just under forestry, we did 5,700 acres of herbicide work this year. And that is the critical step in ensuring we get the right result. Um, sometimes we put up fences. There's still places that no matter how many roads you open, no matter what the landscape looks like, you're getting unacceptable deer impacts. We've really, really scaled back the number of fences we put up, and it's like individually a couple here and there per year. Um, and it's where we have the most extreme issues, just whether it's a terrain issue where guys just won't go and hunt these valleys. Think about the Sprout State Forest where you have a road across the mountaintop, there's no access from the bottom, and it's super wicked steep down those mountains. That's just a sanctuary for those deer because hunters don't want to get down in there. And I can't blame them because I don't want to go down there either. Um, but fencing is something we look at as an absolute last resort anymore, and it's, it's pretty rare that we're actually putting up any new fences anymore. Um, year 90, we might come in and do that first stage of a shelter wood. This picture is actually from a stand here in the southwest region. Um, I thought that was just an awesome picture of what a shelter wood harvest looks like. You can see big seed producing trees were retained, uh, and the understory, the big canopy, was really opened up. Um, year 95, you come back and, and conduct that next overstory removal, and then Maybe if it's an oak stand, we might end up doing a prescribed fire in there to release that oak regeneration from competition from other undesirables. So to <coughs> think about where we all stand in this process, I just described a potentially a hundred year process. Just now you're back to removing the fence and you're back to the beginning again. Um, our forestry staff, you know, 35 years is, is your career. You're affecting a very small portion of this. So the planning, the documentation of what we do, um, we take it very seriously so that the next guy that comes in behind me can pick up my projects and know what I was thinking and know the data that I used to, to generate these things. Um, and something we're, we're getting a little more involved in in recent years is really starting to talk about the outcome as opposed to just the output. Um, everything I've talked about so far is how many acres of timber do we harvest? How many acres of prescribed fire do we put on the ground? How many acres of things do we plant? We talk in terms of output numbers. What we haven't talked a lot about over the years is what is the outcome of that output? What are the results in a qualitative perspective? What are we regenerating? Are we getting the right kinds of regeneration? Is it is it causing birds to now come back and use these sites that they didn't use before? Are we seeing more turkey broods because we've done the right thing? You know, are deer flooding into these areas? You know, are we getting the results of the habitat you know that we want? Um, the output goals are important because that's how you measure the program progress. Um, that if you're going to look at giving me some more funding to hire some more foresters, you want to know I'm going to have more outputs, right? So that's important. But equally important on the back end of that is making sure that we're getting the right outcome. And if we can document things the right way, follow it through the process, and then look back at ourselves and say, well, did we get what we wanted? Did we get what we thought we were going to get or not? And then let's go back through and find out why not. And then we change what we do based on that information in a more formal way. We've kind of always done that, but not formalized. Um, so that's essential to the adaptive management kind of process. You know, moving forward, um, assessing the operational implementation. If I said I wanted to shoulder wood to 80 square feet basal area, which probably doesn't mean much to many people in here, but that's our metric, did I actually achieve that? Or did something happen along the way where I had a wind event or a mortality event that caused me to go down to a 60 square feet basal area? I have to document and know that to be able to look at the outcome and say, hey, did I get what I thought I was going to get? Because if I have a changing condition. And then, then go back and look at the outcomes years later and say, did this result in what we wanted? And, and implement that adaptive management process and learning from our own efforts. Research inherently is behind a lot of times. You know, by the time you see a problem, get a research project in place, get the publication out, you got new problems. So we can use practitioner-driven adaptive management strategies to really help speed that cycle up. Uh, and one of those things that I'm gonna let Paul talk a few seconds here about um, some of the things we're doing going forward um, to, to help speed that process. Let's pick him up after lunch. Pick him up after that? I think I've only got four, four more slides. Is it? All right, let's roll it. All right, um, 
thing off with what Dave was talking about here. On the left it's a, it is the treatment assessment, on the right is the evaluation. The assessment, and I'll just to give you an idea of how quick our process we're trying to make this to run itself. Uh, the assessment will measure the output that Dave was talking about. Did we actually implement it the way we wanted it to be implemented? The evaluation will measure the results of it. Now, what we're looking at here will be given to the foresters on the smartphones. When everybody gets them, we'll be ready to roll it out. This will be able to be in their hands, in the field, as they're doing it, and they can fill these forms out in literally a matter of minutes. The best benefit of this is this can be shared across the state for Forester Forester because all of this will be on our online account so that when they go in and make a sale, if they're working in the Northwest and they're working in an area that's similar to an area in the Northeast, they can bring up the results that someone already worked in that area said that they say, like Dave said, they marked it down to 80. They said it worked very well. Well, we can implement that on our side now. And then the evaluation side on the right here, hands on show up. Okay. That'll go through. We'll go back after a set amount of time after the sale's been implemented, after the harvest has been implemented, the herbicide's been implemented, whatever the treatment was, it will measure the results. How many seedlings per acre did we grow? What percent kill did we get from a fire or a herbicide project? And then we can start to truly correlate results to the work that was done. Because we don't want to go through and deem something to be a failure based on the way it was implemented if we don't know how it was implemented. So this will give us the ability to real time track the success of our operations. Um, one of the things the building on what Dave was talking about was the forest health issues that we're dealing with with managing this stand. Now this isn't the greatest picture, but I'll show you why. You see all the little brown dots on there that Dave describes like looking as like one dots of muddy rain. Every one of those is either a single dead oak tree or a clump of dead oak trees. Now this was from uh, Bing's aerial photography, copyrighted in 2018. So that means all of those trees have died since 2016. They, I've walked that stand. It's uh, almost every one of those is a dead chestnut oak. 16 inches or bigger. This is on <coughs> 80 on the Blue Mountain, uh, school called Ber Berks County, that area. And since that picture was taken, I'd say the amount of mortality in that stand that you're looking at there had doubled. Um, but we are working on what's called degraded stands. We've been defining them, whether they're degraded through insect and disease, through advanced age, or past forestry practices. Uh, the degraded stands. What that means is they don't give us the same opportunity to manage them that they would have, say, 30 years ago when they were healthy. Uh, it's all based on the health of the overstory and the ability to regenerate that stand. Uh, I know when you, we see this picture here and we talk a lot about forest health issues, when we talk a lot about gypsy moth, um, but this stand that we're looking at here, the last time it was foliated by gypsy moth, I believe was 2014 and then all of the native insects that came in afterwards were secondary stressors that finished it off. Um, where that's gonna be a problem moving forward is most of our natives prefer the white oak family, which would be white oak and chestnut oak. That's why all the chestnut oak are dying in here. Um, this is gonna be a big change for us moving forward. Uh, we've talked about defining what's called restorative management, where you take these stands like this, where Dave talked about that we know what happens if you do nothing, you do nothing, bad things happen. Uh, this is going to be a whole new strategy of management because we do not have the same overstory capabilities that we did 10, 15 years ago. Uh, so we are basically learning as we go. That's where the real-time evaluation comes in handy to help these guys. Uh, give you an idea of how bad these forest health issues are. Like I said everybody talks about gypsy moth as being the big problem. But all these have hit in the last 10 years at some point in the state and caused significant foliation, mortality, or damage somewhere in the state at one time or another. Um, Forest 10 caterpillar shows up there at the top, the foliated 600,000 acres across the northern tier, I want to say in 2013. Um, 
it's the biggest defoliation we've had of anything since the 2006 through 2009 gypsum moth outbreak when we hit about a million acres with gypsum moth. So the forest tent hit on top of gypsum moth. What ends up happening is uh, this is one of the first things I worked on when I got here with our GIS department. We put together what are called the damage maps. What you're looking at here, the red in the middle, this is our game land 75 in Lycoming County. That reddish orange in the middle um, has been defoliated or damaged, mapped as damaged as many as 16 times. Uh, this is based on DCNR's aerial survey information dating back to 1963. So you think 16 times and 63 doesn't sound like that much, but basically it averages about for once every five years. Uh, Forest Sur Service research has shown that mortality will linger 10 years after a stress event. So basically what happens in a stand like this, just about the time those trees start to recover, something hits them again. I like bringing up this one because of the green on the east side there, those are less than four events. So those are the healthiest stands we have. Um, I don't know if there's any part of this state that has not been defoliated at least four times. Uh, you go back to the 80s and we were losing four million acres a year to defoliation, so that's kind of a big deal. Uh, these maps here are available to all the foresters now. They're on our online account, and I do know that there are some foresters that are already using these to go out on the game lands and start their management decisions. They're focusing on the red areas before those stands fall apart even further. Um, Definitely helps too. We have a lot of younger staff. Uh, I've talked to some people. Uh, they we're not here in 2003, say when the tornadoes hit across the northern tier. So that was kind of eye opening to realize that I guess I've reached that age where I look at young people and I'm like, I don't know. <coughs> it's because of the age grade. So uh, this is allowing them to see the extent of damage that happened from like the 03 storms, the 08 jet moth outbreaks, the 09 outbreaks, and let them understand why their stands look the way they do, and it helps with their management decisions. So hopefully moving forward, even more people as we go into the next round of management planning will be using these. Uh, like I said, we are, they are already implemented. And just to give you an idea of why this is such a problem, uh, this is... I thought we had a bigger screen. All that tannish brown, depending on what screen you look at there in the middle, age class wise, is 80 to uh, 125 years old. And then if you compare it to the previous slide, it's exactly where all the red was. So those stands are old and they've been repeatedly damaged. Now I do know those guys that are in the North Central have worked heavily in that area. Um, basically, they knew without us telling them that that was a problem. Uh, first time I showed them these maps, they were like, yeah, that's what we have all of our issues. I'm like, well, glad I'm a couple years late now. Yeah. Uh, you want to jump oh, yeah, this, this is the last one. We're working on this together. Yeah, so the last one, um, we participated, the Game Commission, um, in the Allegheny National Forest Health Collaborative Project. It was a grant fund thing um, over the last, it took about a year. Um, and as a spin-off of that, when that was kind of finished up, there was a group of us that kind of got together at lunch one day and said, man, you know, we got to stick together, continue to talk about what we felt was like one of the biggest problems was these degraded stands that don't fit into the normal decision process in silviculture. Um, so we kind of put together kind of an ad hoc group with no real um, charge other than one person, Andrea Hilly from the U.S. Forest Service on the Allegheny, has been kind of the leader keeping us all together. Um, but what we're trying to do is come up with new decision charts and build a publication for practitioners um, where research doesn't really exist in this area yet to tell us the answers. So we've gotten together. The, the one picture there you can see is like a chalkboard. And that was one of the days that was we were breaking out of dichotomous decision key of how we're going to go through, you know, if we have regeneration, is it desirable, is it acceptable, is it abundant, moderate, and then like breaking it down to get us to decision processes and what to do. Um, so um, the other picture on the left was a field tour that we did, actually not a game lands, and we did some uh, DCNR lands. We had like 20-something professionals out there looking at these sites, trying to work up new decision tools um, 
for foresters, and it's a there's private folks involved, there's uh, federal, there's BCNR, there's us and the Game Commission, um, really working hard to try to give the people in the field better tools, better guidance, um, and I, I'm hopeful I'm, we're going to be starting to put things on paper. It's been six eight months we've been working together now, several several meetings, several field trips, um, a lot of you know looking at some products, some prioritization guidelines, to trying them out in the field. Taking it back to the office, saying, "Well, that doesn't quite work right. We got to tweak it." Um, we're going to be hopefully getting something uh, out in publication, I think, next year. So, just wanted you to know that Game Commission Forestry staff is staying engaged at that level too. So, that's it, and not too long. We can do your lunch break. Any questions for Dave? I'd like to make a comment. <laughs> Since we all want to go to lunch, I'm not going to give you questions. I, and I have a million of them. Five million. No problem. My comment is from one forester to another bunch. Outstanding presentation. Really very good. Thanks. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> I've got a ton of questions, and I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed with the progress you guys made in the last 15 years, 20 years. Thank you. Super. We're trying hard. We've got good, we got good people on the staff. and. and We've turned over a lot of staff in the last yeah. 10, 12 years. I'm, I'm to the point where I started in 2002 and there's only, I think, six people left in the forestry program that have been around longer than right. And a few of them are getting ready to go. So it's kind of an interesting time where we've got a new team of, um, of young folks. Well, the old, you know, the old school, you know, God, God rest his soul, Jake, Jake Sittler, yeah. we didn't do anything. The land will take care of itself. I mean, you know, and that, that, was, that was the philosophy. You know, that's so we're always available. You got any questions? I, no, please, please. I encourage all of you to reach out to me. Please. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to spend some time with you guys. Great job. Thanks. <laughs> Hope everybody enjoyed lunch. Steve, you want to try to keep us awake now? <laughs>
more than any other, I think caught us by surprise, the extent to which there's pushback from those who are skeptical of what the science is saying on it. So we're, we're doing a survey to understand that skepticism, see where it's coming from, uh, see where the resistance is, and um, understand our, our hunters, their, their thoughts on it, and how we can better, better reach them. So we have a survey plan um, asking hunters about their, their thoughts on this issue. Sure. I read brochure, and I didn't think it spelled out enough in the brochure as to why exactly the eagles are so susceptible to even very small amounts of lead. Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a very fair point, and that is some of the feedback we're getting. If people are saying that, wait, what's separate about eagles as opposed to any other species? So, no, I appreciate your point there, and I think it's something that we'll take a look at. Um, also, of course, we have chronic waste disease. This is an ongoing effort as well. Um, the past few months, we've had multiple brochures and handouts as well, out to the regions to give, um, specifically targeting DMAs, multiple press releases, and correspondence on this issue. We're looking at drafting letters to our processors and our taxidermists to make them aware of the importation ban for the fall. We've standardized the PowerPoint uh, for our regions to use in the presentations. It's also it's going to be an issue or a segment in the uh, November issue of Game News. We've done uh, press releases announcing the multiple <coughs> houses that we're having across the state. And uh, new initiatives, we're partnering with neighboring states. And this is something Director Burhans brought back from the, the AFA conference, the idea of reaching out to other states and knowing who from Pennsylvania buys a license in, say, New York. And then sending a mailer to those those hunters and New York doing the reverse, knowing who in New York um, buys the license in Pennsylvania, and letting them know about the importation ban, so that we don't have uh, deer crossing state lines, <coughs> given the fact that this year it would be unlawful to bring a deer back from any other state or see it be given friend. So we're, we've reached out with New York, established a communication there, good partnership, and we're going to be doing that with Ohio, and I think uh, Maryland has expressed interest as well. And again, we just continue to uh, promote that through social media as well. Uh, a new program that we're pretty excited about is we were able to offer for the first time free game news to our HD graduates this fall. Uh, that took effect in September, so anyone who goes through the HD class this fall uh, will get a game news for September, October, November, and December. It's just a way that they can keep in touch with the agency, uh, learn about what the agency is doing, and keep an interest in hunting. And uh, we've uh, designed some of the articles in the game news that month for the uh, audience of young, potentially new hunters. A smartphone app. Um, I'm happy to say we're in the very late stages of development with this. It's been a long time coming. Many features on it, I won't try to name them all, but uh, you can see it's got a lot available for an individual who downloads it. Um, and I was told I can offer that Lindsay has the, the app in its what we hope is finished stage on her phone. We're doing what's called beta testing it, where we're making it available on a very limited base first, just to make sure that uh, there are no bugs, there are no uh, inaccuracies in it. Um, I actually talked to the training school, and they're going to let us put it on the cadets when they go out for field assignment at the end of this week, so we can have it tested throughout the, throughout the state, with the goal of then you know having it finally available for our hunters to put in their hands uh, here in, in very shortly. It should be available on, on Apple and iTunes. Um, by the end of the week. So we're rolling forward with that. It's been a long time coming. I think we're all excited to get that uh, completed. Um, also, we were, else, we, were, we were asked to develop a campaign uh, just raising awareness within the elk management areas on uh, the presence of elk. Because every year it happens where uh, at least one or two elk are killed by accident by hunters who say we did not know they were there. So we contracted with an artist, uh, Bob Sobchik, who works with us in game news, and he has designed some posters that will be the point out to that region to raise awareness. <coughs> We've also been doing some marketing <coughs> campaigns that have been designed to increase the sale of additional licenses, not just the base license, but rather some of the add-ons. Uh, one that we used this summer that would turn out to be pretty successful was uh, one for increasing elk applications. So we designed several email blasts to take place and social media posts uh, right up until the point of the deadline, uh, and they proved to be pretty successful. We had a 6,000 uh, increase in applications this year alone, 
on individuals who participate in the program, or wanted to participate in the program by getting a permit. Uh, we actually conducted a focus group of some of those individuals because we could identify the late purchasers, and we asked them, did the social media post to the email have an effect? And they said it absolutely did. I would have not thought to apply if not for the email in my inbox. So uh, that's a way we're pretty happy about that we've been able to increase the sale uh, applications and put more money into, into the area. We're looking at doing the, the same this fall with the pheasant program. And this is going to take several different forms. We have uh, some, a video plan. One has already been developed and has been put on social media and YouTube. And then we are going to uh, develop two new videos in conjunction with Pheasants Forever. And we'll continue a social media email campaign uh, throughout the fall. One thing about the stockings this year for Pheasants is it's not just a um, one-time season. We want to try to get away from that idea. We want our hunters to know that there's going to be stockings throughout the year. In fact, we're increasing the number of stockings and more are going to be available late in the season. So we'll target uh, this campaign accordingly to keep the hunters uh, thinking about hunting pheasants and going out and buying that permit. And then we're also going to be doing the sale, the same with archery licenses, trying to increase sales by um, targeting individuals who have shown in the past an interest in archery. So we'll send them some targeted emails. And this is this is being this is a multi-state project that we're working on in conjunction with the Archery Trade Association. And then the last one I have for this uh, slide, this part of the presentation, is a pretty significant endeavor that we're getting ready to roll out. Uh, is we're working with the group Responsive Management on a communications plan. Um, and just give you some of the background. In recent years, because the states have received so much Fitman Robertson funds, some states are struggling to spend it all. So the Fish and Wildlife Service has relaxed uh, the rules for what that kind of PR money can be spent on. And the first state where they allowed this was in Maine, where they could use some PR uh, funds to develop a communication plan and then implement it through marketing videos and whatnot. So we're following that model. We've spoken to our, our counterparts in Maine. We've reached out to a firm called Responsive Management, come in and do a, a communications plan and identify what uh, what weaknesses we have as an agency in communicating with the public, not just with our hunters, but with the public at all. So the responsive management has is, is, is begun that work. They're drafting right now a survey that will be for the general public. Um, it's going to be a phone survey, and they're asking them their thoughts on the game commission, what awareness, if any, do they have in the agency, um, game lands, funding, all of those type of questions, just to give us the baseline so that then we can move forward. We've already reached out with the marketing firm that Responsive Management uses to develop videos and targeted ads. And we've begun the conversation with them about once this plan is in place, can we use you uh, for the next step? And they are, they are interested in doing that as well. Um, so that's something that we're pretty excited about. It's going to be a pretty significant uh, project undertaken, but um, it's, it's something that is desperately needed. So we're going to be moving forward with that. Uh, the communications plan should be drafted by the end of this year, and my goal was to be able to present the board with that at the January. That was all I had on that topic. Thank you. And I, I should I apologize for not mentioning earlier. All that, of course, is, is due to the staff that I've had. I had a question. Yes. Well, one of the things that we talked about is trying to establish some kind of a baseline with Thursday and safety. So that down the road, two, three, five years, we can look back and say what we're doing is addressing the issue or helping to address the issue. Mm -hmm. Come on. Yes, and we're going to do that just as we are with the Eagle and Lead. We're going to do a survey on that as well. And we've already had some uh, focus groups to develop some talking points and we'll have a survey. Uh, hopefully that will be done by the end of the year also. So we'll have a baseline on that too. Right. And again, uh, all the credit goes to the IND staff. Just a trip group of individuals to work with. Um, and uh, they had some vacancies this summer that have been difficult to, to move through, but we've got them filled with some uh, really talented individuals, and we're still uh, you know, producing some great content. Next, I was asked to talk about license sales projections, sort of our history, where we've been over the past 10 years. This data here is available from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I just want to explain that first before we get into it too much. Um, 
every state has a different formula for, for counting what constitutes a hunting license hold. Some states don't have just a general hunting license hold. Some states have just specific species tax. So it's difficult to do a comparison when you're just talking to their states and looking at how many licenses they sold. However, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is required to have a formula in order to allocate to the Robertson money. So in order to do a comparison, the best way to do so is not by asking the individual states, but instead using the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service data for what constitutes the sale of the license. So using their data, um, we took a look at what the sales were like from 2008 to 2018. And as you can see there, it's a pretty gradual decline for every state, uh, with the exception of Maryland, I believe, saw about a 1% increase. Every other state, um, looking at our surrounding states, Delaware, New Jersey, Maryland, Virginia, Ohio, New York, and Pennsylvania, every other state uh, experienced a, de a decline. <coughs> like I said, with the exception of Maryland that went up, we were we fared pretty well, 0.55 de uh, decrease over the past 10 years. And this is not too different than what we were seeing in our data. I know there are a few years where we were even seeing increases. So in looking at the license sales data itself over the past 10 years, uh, there could be reason to be optimistic over the next 10 years and uh, you know someone can easily make the assumption that uh, the next 10 years will be just as similar and we'll see a potentially a moderate decrease as well um, and I wish I could say that however I don't think that uh, there's, the data would support that when you get a little deeper into it I thought this would be a good opportunity to talk to the board about that and uh, really the most comprehensive analysis that was done on the subject was completed last year by the Council to Advance Hunting and Shooting Sports. They contracted with the firm to get a deep look at all the data um, from states that wanted to participate. And we were one of the participating states. A total of 26 states um, worked with them, gave them their data, answered any questions that they had so that they could evaluate our licenses and make projections moving forward. And while they didn't get every state uh, to participate, the states that were represented constitute almost 60% of all the licenses sold in the nation. So they had certainly enough data in front of them to make some um, predictions moving forward. And like I said, the, the goal of the project itself was just to better understand the shifts and the trends and what, what we can anticipate uh, over the next couple of years. One thing that this, um, this, this study found is that all license sales aren't created equal. What I mean by that is we can sell licenses to a variety of individuals, um, starting with 12 and then theoretically all the way up to 112. However, what they found is that license sales are not evenly distributed within that graph. Instead, they are heavily favored on one side, and that would be individuals who were born within 10 years of 1960. What they found is that cohort makes up 60 to 65 percent of the license sales nationally uh, is in that group. They also took a look at what they call the age effect, which is there reaches a point when individuals just no longer buy a hunting license. Um, and we all know some people, and I, and I think there's that assumption that you buy a hunting license until the year where you, know, you die. But that's just simply not true. What a lot of people do is make the decision to no longer buy at a certain point in their life. Mr. Frederick, you and I were talking about this yesterday in the context of elk hunting, that when that window closes, you know when it's closed and you can't do it anymore. Now that was granted on the stream, but there is some, some physicality even in hunting in Pennsylvania. You can drag in white tail deer. And people realize at some point in their lives, it's just not something that I'm going to continue doing. So what they found is that cohort effect, again, in the early 60s, people stopped buying licenses, and by early to mid 70s, they really stopped buying licenses make that decision that hunting is just isn't for me anymore. With fishing, it's not uh, quite as drastic in that you can fish, you're finding people are fishing into their late, late 70s and even early 80s. I think we all understand there's a, you know, a lot less involved in really in a trout than dragging the gear. So that doesn't make really no sense. Um, and then when they looked at those two dynamics and brought them together is when it, it begins to get sobering. Knowing that we have a large part of our license buyers in that time period in life when they're uh, in the 50s, 60s, they are colliding with the age effect and they're coming up quickly to the point where they're no longer going to be buying hunting licenses. 
So what they, what they found is by 2024, we're going to start seeing the results of that. And it's going to be pretty dramatic when people are just deciding to go for a variety of reasons that we're at a point in life where they're no longer buying hunting licenses. And then by 2032, we'll be experiencing that in a more significant fashion. So to give you an idea of what those numbers look like, these are the national license sale projections <coughs> over the next seven, eight years. So if they're, what they're projecting, again, is this is the cohort effect and the age effect uh, intersecting. And we're going to see a fairly steady incline within the next two, three years that's going to pick up pretty rapidly. Um, all, all the way down to 2025, they're anticipating up to 30% of those buyers will no longer move. So and I, I should point out, they show resident hunt and resident combination. Of course, just about every state, I believe every state, but Pennsylvania offers the combination. So that combination license includes hunting. So you can't just look at the hunt, hunting, resident, that's all it's involved. It's the combination. So when you combine those declines, um, you'll see that it's pretty significant, potentially, here in the near future. <coughs> they went ahead and projected is that by 2032, state wildlife agencies are going to face great challenges and revenue shortages, loss of political capital, and shrinking social relevancy. And that is just, again, a combination of individuals deciding they can no longer hunt, and the fact that a majority of our licensed buyers are within that age group, where this is a decision that they're going to have to make in the near future. Um, what we can conclude from that, um, we saw the graph at the beginning of this chart, at the beginning of this presentation, that showed a gradual decline over the past 10 years. Moving forward, the decline is not going to be as gradual. It's going to be instead fairly significant. And again, if you just look at the sales sales data, it would indicate that it's coming quickly. When you only see a half a percentage decline over the next 10 years, however, when you take into consideration the age effect, decline is going to be coming rapidly, probably more so than what we would have anticipated. Um, don't want to leave on a down note, thinking that all is lost, because there certainly are ways that we can mitigate against this and potentially um, you know, bring in new license buyers and license revenue. And I think the first one that needs to be noted is the marketing and sale additional funds. I talked about what we were able to do with the elk application this past summer. We had 6,000 new people interested in buying an elk application. That doesn't mean that there were 6,000 new hunters that had because they weren't hunters, they were existing hunters. But for the first time, they considered buying an elk application. Uh, the pheasant hunt is another opportunity for that as well. Archery. So what you can always do is look at your customer base and see are there ways where we can upsell, where we can increase the amount of licenses that they're buying. And we certainly have plenty of opportunities for that. With the ones I mentioned, in addition to bear, the second spring turkey, spring turkey tag. So we'll keep marketing them to try to uh, mitigate against the loss of revenue. Uh, from the report, they recommended simplifying regulations. Keep it simple. Model. And uh, Commissioner Fox, him and I have spoken many times about the plus orange regulation, and I know that's his, been his goal with moving that forward all along, is, is to keep it simple. Because we do know there's a large segment of our licensed buyers who don't follow what happens on a day-to-day -day or weekly basis. You know, they only think about hunting as it gets late into the fall. And if, if the regulations are too confusing, if they don't know what's in season or where, where they can hunt, chances are they won't buy a license. So a way to reach them is to simplify the regulations. Also, a focus on the middle generation. We talk a lot, a lot about youth. We have certainly a lot of programs and seasons for the youth. And then given the fact that a lot of our hunters are on the older end of the spectrum, I think the board hears from them a lot. I know we do as well. Um, but what gets forgotten is those in the middle. Uh, we don't pay enough attention to them potentially. And what's, what's interesting about them is you have potential for not just getting one person to buy a hunting license, but we, what we find is people who used to hunt at some point in their life start thinking about hunting again when they have children who are reaching the age where they can go hunting. So it's a potential to not just get one individual in, but get a two for one or three for one. And I had to laugh as I had this presentation up over lunchtime. Uh, one of the individuals who works here at the team named Saul, and he said, oh, hunting, I used to do that. And I said, well, and I asked like, why you stopped. And he looked at me about his early 30s and he said, I don't have the time for that anymore. So there is a large segment of people who want it, who have hunted at some point, still potentially have an interest and just feel like they don't have the time. And I know Commissioner Daly, I have the discussion that you started with the Saturday over deer season. The research would, would certainly indicate that's uh, 
something that we should be looking at is creating more time and more opportunity for those younger, those in that middle generation. And then last is creating opportunities for small and young. Every state makes a mistake of focusing on here. Big game is where it's at. We know 75% at least of our licensed buyers, that's why they're hunting the state. That's why they're buying the license. However, what we forget is a lot of them started on small game. Uh, our, our three coordinator, Derek Stoner, who did a presentation for the board back in July, he told me he recently did a youth waterfowl, which he took two kids under the age of 13 out, under the age of 15 out for the first time. And they went waterfowl hunting and had a blast. They, they loved it, they can't wait to do it again. I said, well, did they harvest anything? He said, between the two of them, they harvested one duck and it took them three boxes of shells. <laughs> they really enjoyed that. That's what, that was something that kept them active. They, they loved it. And if, you know, compare that to the deer hunt where you might be sitting patiently in a tree stand um, for hours on end. That's not what's going to attract uh, you know, the younger generation. So, I know the board moved forward and uh, Director Berg has a big motivation for him with the managed duck field was recruitment. And the research would suggest that's something that the board should also be taking a look at. So those opportunities, are, are there other opportunities out there where uh, we can make changes to provide more opportunities for young and new hunters to go smoking? So those are some options that the board has as well. And uh, my presentation. Any questions, comments for Steve? Question. On the data that the federal license is only a half or something like that, that I've been so fast, is that counting tags and everything? So we get a call stuff. Okay, that person is not wanting to keep certain tags or help. Is that pure hunting? They clearly count more than we do when it comes to just pure hunting licenses. If you would look at ours from that year, I believe the feds had estimated around 920 and we were at 960. So they're counting something extra, but not too substantially. That's ballpark of what our numbers are. And I just don't know enough about what your formula is. I'm sure some of the staff will look at that. It's not out of line. It's not out of line, no, it, it's, it's certainly not. Thank you. It's consistent with what we expect. Any others? No, I just wanted to say, Mr. on the, uh, the small eagle issue, Steve. Yeah. So, you know, you took the time, you were up to be out there, new or whatever. These non-believers, I don't know how you reach them. I mean, I guess for me, the telling moment was actually seeing x-rays that showed the lead fragments in the stomach of the eagle, and you could clearly see that they were jacketed cartridges. <laughs> but that was black and white, too, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so when you, look, you see it's actually a jacketed bullet, it's like, what more proof do you really need? So, um, so I, don't know, I think we need to keep working on that. The other thing we need to work on though is a way to reach people that aren't already hunters. Okay, we already have, we have all this stuff where we're 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 asking you know people about you know how, what would it take to get you hunting? Well, we're hunters. I mean, we are hunting, and um, so I, I think we need to be able to tap into other mailing lists or whatever to be able to start talking about prospective hunters and not keep asking ourselves the same questions, you know? Yeah, I do. I just point on, on Baldi, I think it's valid. As I said, that surprised us probably the most is the extent to which there's resistance to doing that. Um, and I'm not sure where it comes from, and that's why we wanted to do a survey to find out, you know, how can we penetrate that? Um, absolutely. And I, I, Appreciate your point as well, um, expanding our ways to think about recruiting new hunters. You know, for those of us who grew up, we think we know the track, but you know, how do we speak to those who didn't have that experience and could reach them? So it's a it's a never-ending progress. <coughs> Any others? Yes. Steve, where, where are we? I, I <coughs> maybe you have got an answer to this, maybe you're not. I don't know. But what, where are we in relation to um, moving forward with? Making more use of electronics and cell phones, and emails. And, and in what context? And in, in the context of, every, of, of everything you talked about, recruitment, yeah. you know, reporting kills. Right. Uh, just like you said, the one gentleman about the, you know, the elephant drop. Yeah. He, he wouldn't. He wouldn't remember what the number he had gotten eaten. Right. So I mean. Yeah, I think we're we're trying to modernize. You know, every way we can and thank you for bringing up that elf line because I was looking at that data 
I mean, that's, that's important. It is. And that's how most people's lives run. Right. Yeah. right. Let's see if I can find that as a way. Well, we, you can see, because you can notice when, I apologize, I'll just scroll through all this. But you can see the point where we realized that we weren't reaching people around 2012. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the numbers were bottoming out there. And sure enough, in 2013 onward, we decided, why don't we do an email marketing campaign and see what happens? and the numbers speak for themselves. So uh, we're getting a return on investment with these projects that would indicate we should be focusing our resources on them. Um, this is, you know, whenever you talk about Facebook, you know, years ago people were skeptical of them. However, when you see the amount of clicks that you can get for a post and what kind of reach we can have and how we can reach hundreds of thousands of people, we have we have reason to believe that this is you know, this is the fact is it's working. Well, what, I, what I'm thinking is, you know, years ago, people were really tight with their mailing lists. Yeah. Is that, is, that, is that still the case? It is. It is. One thing that we've done in recent years, and when we looked at these results, we thought, man, we got to find a way we can do that. And we currently only have, um, it's my understanding, I might be wrong, but we only have about 16% of our hunter licenses. We only have email addresses for about 16% of that. 16? 16%. Yeah. So 84% of our hunters are out there without having the ability for us to send them an email. Why, why, don't, why do we only have 16? We, it's not required. It's, it's not required that they give us that. Well, that, that's exactly the question I'm asking. Yeah. Are, are we getting our heads together? And are we, are we talking about getting 100%? I would love nothing more than that. that, would are, that my are we talking about? It would require, uh, well, the fact that we just lost our licensing vendor moving forward presents a potential snag, because I know the company that we had talked with, I, I met with them and said, we'd like more data as far as email addresses, and they understood where we were coming from. Unfortunately, that that fell through and we're back in the limbo. But we'd love nothing more. Can you talk about the ability to just target them with a glass like this? It could be excellent. One thing. And I asked like, well, how can we get more emails? And one thing we've done in recent years that has been very successful is we've done um, picture campaigns uh, along with your harvest. Send us a picture of your deer, and we run that on social media. We're going to do that again now, but you have to, in order to be eligible, send us your email. So we're just going to cast the net and just try to get as many email addresses to increase that value. Well, you know, not, not only emails, but cell phone numbers for text for texting. I mean, can we, as a state agency, can we do that? We can, yes. I mean, yeah. when I go to pick up my drugs, I don't stand in line anymore. No. I get a text sure. from pharmacy so your drugs when you get picked up. But the problem is, is, is the social media aspect is evolving so quickly. But my kids don't use texting or email anymore. If I'm a little now, I Snapchat them. <laughs> it, it just changed Twitter. Come on, that's long. <laughs> But I mean, it, it just evolves so quickly. But, that, but that's not an excuse not to participate. No, 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 I get that. But I, it, not only do we need to catch up, we need to keep up at some point. Yeah. Well, well, my, that back, goes with my... Back to my question. Doing license online. What are we, what are we doing? Well, you know, are, are we talking about buying lists, you know, mailing lists or, or email lists of people who don't hunt but buy tents and sleeping bags and hiking boots? And so we can communicate with them and tell them what's going on in the hunt in the hunting and wildlife world. I don't believe we've had that that uh, conversation, but maybe we should. Yeah. So that's, that's, what, that's that's kind of where I think the direction we need to be. Right. Do, do do that? That's where we we attempted on two separate occasions to hire a professional marketing person who come with that background and expertise. We were unsuccessful in the candidates even accepting the positions. Um, currently, Steve has struck up a. Um, working with a Commonwealth marketing firm to help us do that because you know they have the most up-to-date strategic ways how to implement that. Okay. So we continue to look at that, but we have not been able to fill the marketing position at all. Why? Because there's just nobody out there to... They turn it down. They said it's too much work. <laughs> too much work and not enough money. They wanted to know what their yearly bonus was like. <laughs> <laughs> we told them to give one day of deer hunting off a year. We say if you did a good job, you'll get more work. That's <laughs> Like to Denny's point, like myself, as insurance, I can target people that are in yeah. Harley Davidson shop right now and sell them. We target we people have, that are going. We, we have, I, 
about out of my depth of knowledge as far as that analytics and how that works. I know well, well, we do everything on here, so Google does everything. It does. They they just and then it gives it to your end. Yeah, they know where you're at. The they ask have your be, location services turned off. The ask would be the violations, right? And that's one of the difficulties we have is we can't buy the license online and get it immediately. Um, I know that's an issue that we talked about. We did a focus group with people who buy a range permit asking why do you buy a range permit? And what they said is I like the fact that I can print it right now, it's right there. If I want to go shooting, I just buy it and print it on there. As opposed to sending an application to the club, you know, wait a month for them to have their meeting, vote me in. You know, people want things immediately. Absolutely. So uh, we're always trying to catch up with the Google targets. It doesn't matter if you have license. They know who has license. Yeah. <laughs> so everything you, else. Can. You don't have to reinvent that. You right. can pay Google the seven thousand dollars a month, which is cheap for the. I mean, that's to target people in Pennsylvania. Yeah. I know we've done that with social media. We've done Facebook as well. Yeah. For advertisements where they follow you right. across the internet. And, oh, look at that. Here's something to help them. They know. Right. We've done that as well. Okay. So, so Steve, this is a conversation that we need to have moving forward. I think. Oh, we we'll try to see if we. Can. Technology is always evolving. The methods of selling is always evolving. We're trying Absolutely. to keep up with it. Right. Sure. Okay. Good. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So this time I'm going to have um, Tom Fazy come forward. Tom is the uh, uh, director of the Southwest region. He will introduce our our next presenter. Please. President Lee. Welcome to the beautiful uh, Laurel Highlands and the wonderful Southwest region where the sun always shines. <laughs> <laughs> just can't see it through the clouds. Just can't see it through the clouds. <laughs> <laughs> Up above there, it's shining. Uh, uh, I'm happy that the board came out uh, to the region. Uh, and I'm really, uh, I want to thank uh, President Lee and Commissioner Mitrick and Commissioner Kinnick for coming out yesterday and, and other senior staff who were able to come out a little early yesterday and, and go through our game lands tour uh, that we held in Cambria County, Northern Cambria County. Uh, I've been around this agency quite a while now and I've spoken about it before in front of the board and to everyone that I meet. And what makes this agency so special is the, the quality of the employees that we have and the passion for the mission and the resources. And you see it every commission meeting when you see the staff come up and give reports. Um, and, and you certainly saw it yesterday, I hope, when you went through that tour. You know, um, that this tour is a, a, a we our region, just like every region, is blessed with with these wonderful people who work for us. Uh, every every aspect, every every job classification across the agency. Like I said, the passion for the commission and the resources evident. Uh, so we have uh, habitat management crews and our foresters and our biologists and our law enforcement, full-time law enforcement game wardens and uh, our deputy game wardens. All those folks were participating in yesterday's tour and I can't thank you guys enough for coming out because that meant everything to them. For you guys to come out and see them and appreciate what they do because I think you saw the passion they had for, for what they're able to accomplish on those game wardens. So, you know, if, if you're a member of the public and you get a chance to go on one of the skin lands tours in any region in the state, take advantage of it. Uh, so I want to thank the staff for putting it together. I had nothing in it. All I did was ask for it to be done. And uh, Dan and, and, and Patrick and, and all the staff that, that worked on it and, and participated in it, they had it done. And it was a wonderful time with me. So anyway, speaking of game lands, uh, 108 in Northern Cambria, one of the unique aspects of that game lands, and if you've never been there, I encourage you to take a trip up and, and, and visit it. Uh, just don't go during woodcock season, because it's mine then. <laughs> but, uh, one of the aspects of that game lands is it's, it's reclaimed strip mine land. And in spite of our efforts at, at managing the habitat there, which the, the, the staff and, and the foresters and the habitat crews have done a great job with what they got up there, the soils are terrible. And uh, I asked Dan Yonner, he's the land management group supervisor for that game lands in, in Cambria County, to come and talk about a unique 
a program that kind of is outside the box thinking where we've been able to, he and, and his crew has been able to, to accomplish some uh, enrichment of that soil. So, Dan, come on up. I wish I could want me to get this started for you. Or you want So later, maybe tomorrow after a meeting, we can do some skiing. <laughs> yep. You got to go to slideshow. calcium carbonate, which you know is lime, to bleach the paper and make it white. Well, some of it is left over. This is the blah, blah, blah explanation of what it is. But the byproduct is roughly 10% lime still uh, left in this wood fiber. And there's some other inner feathers and clays and solid, but it's all biosolid. Or, uh, it doesn't need any permitting, it's not hazardous, it's just natural material. Um, so, we found out, what are you guys doing with your byproduct? We found out that the Tyrone Paper Mill makes about 300 tons per week of the byproduct. They have to get rid of it. Piles up in their storage area, they pay a contractor to come and take it away. We don't have to do it, get rid of it. Worst case scenario, they would have to take it to the landfill, Historically, they took it to a lot of coal mines that were, as they were closing, they used it. Um, we all know that through the previous administration, coal mining had really gone downhill. They were looking for places. So when we contacted them, they were really happy that we called. We're only, our game lands are roughly 15 miles from the paper mill. Their biggest cost of getting rid of it is trucking. So we're only 15 miles away. They can truck it up to us and spread it out and um, the bottom line is that in return for them having a place to put it, they'll also spread it out, incorporate it into the soil and plant within reason anything I ask them to plant and it doesn't cost us anything. So, uh, wow, this sounds like a pretty good opportunity here. There's some typical soil, uh, some typical, this is one example of really bad soil. 
the Northern Queen 174 in the Indiana County. Uh, we're targeting areas like this and we're targeting the areas around our warm season grass fields. We're using a much more prescribed fire to uh, manage our uh, game lands and of course you need fire breaks somewhere to stop the fire. We're planting, uh, we're spreading the mulch, planting uh, clovers, keep green strips around the warm season grass fields. I really like these long linear food plots. We border the big fields with clover, provides uh, uh, food and uh, brooding areas for the turkey bolts and of course uh, everything likes clover. I like turkeys. Mary Jo likes me. No, I mean I like Mary Jo. This is some of the worst area, uh, but we can actually grow stuff on this. This is basically sterile ground. Rainwater hits this, percolates down through to the old mine pit floors, seeps out right into the trout stream, massive mine drainage. Theory is if we get some vegetation on the surface, if we uh, use the rainwater rather than letting so much of it percolate through. So they hauled in by triaxle load, uh, like I said, 300, 300 uh, ton a, a week on the average is how much the, the mill produces. Uh, we're on the tour yesterday, realized it's kind of stinky. Anybody's driven through a town with a paper mill knows what it smells like. It's not very pleasant. Um, we put it on, this is a really heavy application because the soil was so bad, there was very little soil at all, so we put it on roughly 300 ton per acre. Normally we put about 200 ton per acre on. They use, this is all the, the Freemer Excavating uh, Incorporated as the contractor. This is all their equipment, uh, this is just a big chisel plow, they spread that out. They run that implement over the ground to incorporate it in. It loosens up the ground, mixes it in. Put one layer down, they chisel plow it. They put another layer down, they chisel plow it again. Uh, this is that same area that's really sterile. It's right along the trout stream and the game lands. They, uh, this is on game land 108, where we're working right now. Um, this soil, as you can see, is much better. There's some vegetation there, not really good. It's mostly fescue grass that's growing. That's the grass that's in most people's yard. It's not what we want for wildlife. We want legumes and broad leaves and wildflowers and forbs. So uh, we've this, this in already, you can see that the soil's fairly deep and you can hardly even see it. It's already been put on there and mixed in. You can't hardly even see the uh, mulch. Another picture of this. Uh, as you can tell, kind of irregular shapes. These are old strip mines uh, where there's good vegetation. There's some thermal cover from the trees. We leave that intact. Uh, here's a big field. We left some crab apples in the middle. That's all fescue grass. We we spread and incorporated that last year. The plan is, as the uh, paper mulch rots out, it kind of fixes the nitrogen in the soil until it rots. So we uh, leave it there for about six months, ideally, until it breaks down a little more. In the meantime, that fescue grass starts to grow back because we plowed it all up and it starts growing back. Then we go in and spray it with uh, usually Roundup or herbicide, kill the grass, plant what we want to grow there, and no matter what we've planted, it's just done green. Um, we've been using, this is a game commission uh, grain drill and tractor. We've tried a lot of different things. Again, use it for the fire breaks. We plant the mixture of clovers and brassicas, good for deer, turkeys, all the wildlife like to use it. Um, some of these large areas on the strip mines were uh, starting to use a mixture of warm season grasses and uh, the native flowers and forbs. We were uh, tying, it all ties together. We were stalking the pheasants on these areas. I got these large cleared areas, strip mine that um, various degrees of regeneration, some of it 20, 25 years old, some older. Uh, so we're just kind of fine tuning that habitat, planting the uh, grasses that we want to make good pheasant hunting. And uh, it, it's good for all of them. <clears throat> Here's some of that real poor soil a year after we uh, planted a thick, lush lawn, but there's clover growing in there and, the, and uh, some 
buckwheat stems left over, but we're getting we're getting things to grow where there was nothing before. Uh, one challenge that uh, an expense that my crew does have is to haul those triaxle loads of material in. We got to keep our roads up. Most of our roads aren't built for heavy truck traffic. So we spend an awful lot of time. My team does uh, preparing culverts and making the roads farther off in. Uh, this is a brand new road that we built just to get into a section of game lands that was all strip mined and we didn't have real good access. Uh, so we had to build a road in there uh, in order to get the dry axis in there. But I think the juice is worth the squeeze in this case because we're getting so much habitat done that uh, there's no cost for us. There's a lot more detail into it, but that's the basics. We get the, uh, that's just another road uh, along one of the bigger plots. Uh, this 2014 number, I'll just skip the 2017 numbers. Uh, that's what uh, the contractor did last year on uh, two of the game lands. And you can see uh, 18,000 tons of the, of the vapor mulch they buy the seed. They, they, they bought 2,500 pounds of uh, mostly clovers and mixed clovers and brassica. Uh, they bought the fertilizer. That was their employees, uh, 560 hours and 450 hours of their equipment. Uh, when we say top dress, that means we just spread it on the surface. You don't do anything else. Uh, we're doing a lot of that on the uh, warm season grass fields that we already have. The soils are very acidic in general, and they plant it during nine years. So I didn't do it. I guess I could figure out some numbers, but for my guys to go out and plant one acre of ground, buying the lime seed fertilizer, would be $225, $250 an acre. That's not counting their time with the fuel and the tractors and the price of equipment. So, we're getting all this for free, and uh, it's a pretty good deal. Can't haul it very far because of their trucking costs and price of fuel that they've got to put in that triax with the haul. Um, so that's why uh, we did use the PR funding last year to haul it over to uh, Indiana County. And um, Flight 93, the National Memorial down here, the same company did a lot of uh, the planning vegetation work on, on the national site. So, uh, oh, one on, I just stuck that on, you probably can't see it, so it doesn't matter, but um, city of uh, Altoona has many reservoirs in the mountain, and mountain tops are all game lands, water runs down into their reservoirs. Uh, you can see in this lower right-hand corner, it's called the Bellwood Reservoir, and the game lands are in the center of there, and we work together with the Altoona Water Authority people because they have the, all the acid mine drainage problems. And in a nutshell, I asked the guy, uh, I said, do you think what we're doing up here makes any difference? He said, oh my God, yes. He said, 10 years ago, the Bellwood Reservoir was the worst reservoir we had in our system. Every time it rained, the water was so bad, we had to take it out of the, take it offline. He said, the forestry practices that the Game Commission's done on the mountain and the habitat work, along with some of the direct remediation and some of the streams. He said, now Bellwood Reservoir is our best water supply for the city of Altona. That to me and on my team, very rewarding that we're not just doing good work for the family. We're benefiting the water supply, which we all have some support for everyone. I was waiting more than three and a half minutes, sorry. Um, <laughs> any good questions? Anyone have questions? Renee, I just want to thank you for the time that you and, and all your staff to be with us. I know that uh, a lot goes into to hauling senior staff and commissioners around it. But we really appreciate the time. Um, I, I, the, the pictures that you showed were great, but they don't do your game land justice. That game land 108 is it's gorgeous. It's just, a, it's a pearl. And, um, and that's a, you know, all the hard work that you put in and your staff puts in surely shows when you go out there and, and look at the land.
end product. So thank you guys for all of that. Thank you. Like, again, you know, Dr. Fazy thought this was interesting. I appreciate his support. Um, I'm flattered that he took enough interest in this and let me down here and talk about it. So yeah. we, we just do what we do just like every other land manager in WCO or game with him. Well, the relationships that you build, you even talked a little bit about the PennDOT relationship you have with them down there. Um, you know, that, anything we can get for free? Yeah. I like that cost. So, yeah, good job. Appreciate that. You just can't get there. Okay, so we're going to have one more presentation here. This is an important part of our process is uh, Wildlife Management Bureau, we have uh, wildlife management plans. Um, each one of our species biologists has this document what they're doing, why they're doing it, um, expectations, goals, things like that. So we have a rigorous process. And this part of the process, basically, we just received a bunch of public comment on uh, Manager and staff's uh, wild turkey management plan. Uh, in addition from uh, internal review. And so what Mary Jones is going to do is come down with a brief overview of what was given to her through the, uh, uh, the public comment section. Dan was the last presenter. I couldn't see. <laughs> I need to put this back so I can see. Yeah, I'm going to see so that, like I said, it is a 10-year plan. Our goal um, for, for the management plan is to provide optimum wild turkey populations in suitable habitats uh, throughout the, the state, but again, viewing recreation by current and future generations. Um, it's pretty, you know, pretty obvious. But um, the, the big thing is, so to accomplish that goal, we have, um, we have 60 strategies under under six different objectives and i'm not going to um, go through each one of these uh, specifically but i just want to let you know that the six objectives are really based on um, six uh, bureaus within the agency basically this management plan is a, a an agency and partnership wide management plan it's not the bureaus it's not mary joe's management plan it's it's you know it it's a group effort for the next 10 years. Um, it took me since 2015 to develop this because I have a lot in my head and it takes me a while sometimes to get it all down and right, but that's besides the point. Um, so, but with 60 strategies, okay, so it's gonna require a lot of personnel, a lot of budgeting commitments, a lot of partnershiping. Um, and so what we did was we created, just like in the glass management plan, an appendix, basically an implement, implementation schedule. And so to help us keep, stay on track. Um, and, um, and this implementation schedule was reviewed on an annual basis uh, within the agency as well with our partners, especially with a specific elimination of the generation. Um, there's a lot of updated information in this, um, so it's not just the strategies, it's not just the objectives and the strategies, but there's a lot of background information. It's over 130 pages because I thought it was important to have a lot of background information to support our, our strategies. Okay, so we have um, a couple of just quick focuses that I want to um, talk about here. Um, one of the main focuses for the population objective is, uh, well, completing the development of as well as implementing our turkey population models by wildlife management unit, and then uh, integrating our structured decision tool for optimizing um, harvest regulation recommendations to, to optimize populations and, and hunting opportunities. And so those are two main uh, emphasis that we're working on right now to implement into this plan. We have some um, current disease studies and, and future disease studies, of course, all day. We've been hearing about disease, and unfortunately, um, that's going to be consuming a lot more of our resources in the next, uh, well, within the next decade. 
Uh, one thing that is near and dear to my heart, as well as a lot of our game wardens' hearts and, and, and all of our uh, staff, is um, beginning annual uh, leg banding to, to get some uh, more annual harvest rate information. As Heath Mace mentioned earlier, um, you know, staying on track as to you know what our harvest rates are for our population, for our turkey population. So there's a lot more. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, a lot of stuff that we're going to be doing with this management plan and a lot of partnership opportunities, partnering partnering uh, between among the different bureaus uh, with the Bureau of Wildlife Habitat Management. We have a real aggressive. Uh, uh, focus on our habitat objective to <coughs> creating holistic priority areas for um, for harvest habitat management and um, habitat improvements not only at the wildlife management unit level but also at the state game lands um, level and so we're going to be updating our, our turkey habitat suitability model for each of our wildlife management units and to really integrate habitat management and, and population management. Um, so I'm working a lot with Dave on this um, in forestry. Uh, Mitch Blake from the National Wild Turkey Federation, the regional biologist, is going to be working directly with us. So it's going to be a real great um, partnership opportunity. Uh, and I won't go through, well, actually, let me go through. Um, I'm going to focus on our, our hunting heritage, hunter safety objectives. One thing I do want to mention is uh, we're really trying to focus on conducting more surveys. Uh, so obviously we'll need some more revenue or um, some dedicated uh, uh, funding for, for this. But we're looking at um, surveying this year, um, not only the turkey hunters, but also the non-hunting public um, to get some attitudes and, and um, ideas uh, from, uh, from our constituents. The, uh, yeah, the, and I did talk about the entire agency. So the revision process, um, we did, we had an earlier, uh, an earlier draft that we solicited input from the bureaus of regions, the National Wild Turkey Federation, the Pennsylvania chapter, um, and then in July, we provided uh, a public comment period to the public and to the Board of Commissioners, a 60-day period. Um, during that 60-day period, until the end of August, we did uh, receive 180 comments, and those were from 82 different individuals. Um, they were emailed, some fa Facebook, and, and actually some people actually mailed in uh, letters. We, I noticed that there were about 50, there were so from those 108 comments, I could really boil it down to 58 themes. I won't go through each one of those, uh, but there is an appendix number two on the final plan that does have a table uh, regarding all of these comments. So uh, that, that's the summarization of the comments. Uh, and then I, we did incorporate as many of those comments as possible into this final plan. With that comment, we realized there weren't any new strategies that were being asked to be um, created. Well, we had 60 strategies to begin with. <laughs> um, but many of those suggestions um, are going to be incorporated as the strategies are implemented. So it's um, a real good process you know, going through this whole comment period. Um, of course, there were, when you, whenever you ask people for unsolicited comments, uh, you know, you get, you get just about it. Um, so we did only focus on the turkey related uh, comments, <laughs> as you can imagine. Um, so really what it boiled down to was most of the comments were um, the, the commenters providing information on their perception of the turkey population in their area. Unfortunately, about 77% of those commented about their turkey population declining. Um, but we also looked at what are the, you know, the issues that are negatively affecting turkey populations. Well, number one, of course, didn't surprise me, was predation. Well, turkeys are a prey species, so they don't die on their own. Um, 
but it was interesting though, you know, when you, when, and that's why, you know, the surveys that we're going to be conducting for the next 10 years are going to be real important too, because, you know, it's important for us to get an idea of what people, you know, what your constituents really want. And, and you know, 33 of these, um, of these comments were about predation, but 11 of them were recommending that we increase uh, harvests of predators. And fishers, oh my goodness, fishers were really coming up. And then, uh, luckily, we do have an entire section of the uh, management plan dedicated to predation and um, the, you know, the literature about fishers, that they're not turkey killers. Uh, so hopefully some people will <laughs> look to this document um, to get some answers about fishers. So, uh, so that was one thing that I realized we need additional education about. Um, another one, seven of the commenters talked about the spring harvest and how we're decimating our turkey population via the um, you know shooting gobblers in the spring. Well, we all, if anybody has heard me in the during the last you know, 15, 20 years since I've been a turkey biologist, you know, it's not the spring season that regulates your population. So again, we need some more um, additional education on that in, uh, in that spectrum. Uh, too bad Dave's not here because uh, they were really, the, there were a couple of comments that were hammering our, tim our timber harvesting where our game was. Uh, so, but then there were a few comments discussing, you know, how the poor uh, reproduction during, due to weather was causing their declining population. Um, and, several, and six comments saying that we need to conduct more habitat management on our game lands to help turkeys to avoid predation. So that's what we want. We want, we want it. We've educated some of those folks. Um, the, I want to focus here a little bit about the hunting regulations uh, comments. The majority of the hunting regulation comments were centered around the spring hunting season, which is really interesting. But then when I really looked into it, most of those people were upset that we have a two bird bag limit, I think because they're not the successful turkey hunters. Now remember, 15% of our spring turkey hunters are successful, 15 to 18% on average. Um, this past year was 20%, which was unusual, but that's just because we had fewer hunters out there. But um, typically, you know, less than 20% of your spring turkey hunters are gonna take one bird. Well, if they have a second tag, those folks that actually do hunt for the second life, for their second tag, over 50% of those hunters are successful. So I think you just have a jealousy thing going on. Um, but this is real, okay? People are upset. And so they're, you know, they're saying, I don't want somebody else taking two birds before I have even part of city one. So this is something that we can, you know, work on, uh, you know, with during this management plan, perhaps restricting the harvest of the second bird to the last two weeks of the season would provide, you know, more hunter satisfaction? I don't know, and I don't recommend us making any management decisions until we actually conduct some surveys and get some, uh, and, and, and really focus on what the hunters really want for the spring season. Regarding the fall season, it was, the comments were equally, equally split between requesting more liberal and more restrictive regulations, so that tells me that we're doing a good job. But there were a couple of uh, suggestions regarding um, why don't we have an archery only fall turkey hunting season concurrent with the archery deer season. And then bring in the regular turkey season after the close of the archery deer season prior to fair season to allow some turkey hunters the opportunity of being out there in the woods without everybody else hunting. So perhaps we can work that in, you know, after our structured decision making uh, protocol is established. And then there were, um, there were two comments about eliminating high powered rifles for safety's sake. So I just wanted to um, let you know that, that that was out, that is out there. And then um, regarding a, a turkey hunting license, one, one for and one against. So, um, 
In terms of uh, a couple of other comments, were in terms of the depth of the strategies, as I said before, there were there's 60 strategies, and so uh, so what I did for the final plan, um, we didn't feel comfortable with taking it with removing any of those strategies um, because we feel like this is kind of like a as to you know what we're going to do with our turkey pop with turkey management, um, so we really wanted to focus, maintain those strategies. But 30 of those 60 strategies are actually ongoing or annual strategies. And so what we did in the document was we highlighted those annual strategies in red, um, so that and, and, and underlined them in case somebody's printing the, the document out in black and white. Um, just to ensure that people understand that these are um, these aren't strategies that are you know, once and done. Half of them are once and done; the other half are annual. And then uh, another thing that we're going to do, thanks to one um, comment, was to create because the document is over 130 pages; it's quite long. Uh, So we're going to create a 10-page summary that truly specifies the meat and potatoes of the plan and actually becomes the, the working document to be distributed. Uh, I did, we didn't have time to create that 10-page summary before uh, today's meeting, and so that will be one of the first things that we implement um, after the, the final plan is approved. So I just want to um, end on the note that um, you know there was good public re response to to the uh, request for reviewing, and it clearly showed not only support for continued improvement. Um, I guess most of it was improvement of turkey populations. There were some comments that our turkey population was too large. I'd like to. I have their email, so I'm going to ask them to come over and hunt them. Over there. <laughs> Um, but so most of the comments were supportive of continuing uh, improvement. But then I also realized that we, there's a need for um, continued public education outreach on, on not only turkey population management, but also habitat and harvest management. So with that, I will take any questions. I hope I didn't speak too quickly, but I'm trying to get through this for you because I know you have other things on your agenda. Wish you were over. <laughs> Very good. I just want to thank you. You've done a phenomenal job with turkey population. Um, I did have a couple questions, not necessarily about the turkey plan. As wet as this year has been, have we noticed um, or have we seen any effect on the turkey population? Or have you heard of anything that's, that may affect the, the fall season? Or that may want you to change the fall season? No, I have. Um, actually, so what I do to um, to help determine the, the, the fall take is to look at the mass surveys and and, um, and so mass surveys do the, the mass crop is, has been good and surveys and um, so I haven't I haven't reviewed the summer sighting indexes yet um, the the these, uh, the game warden surveys before the public surveys so I don't have um, actual data um, to provide you, but um, it was an unusually wet spring, although the, the good thing is we came into the spring with birds being in very good physical condition because crops, uh, I mean the mass crops last year were excellent and we did not have a harsh winter. So, uh, so the, the adult, typically what that means is that the adult hens um, can, can I know, just anecdotally, there are certain parts of the state, like North Central, and you can't, you know, walk 10 feet without tripping over a turkey. Um, a lot of, you know, in the Northeast state, the north, Northeast part of the state, you know, you're going to be looking a while before you find a turkey. So, um, you know, of course, it, it's always going to vary depending on, on the region of the state. Um, so